Yeah. That's all right. All right. So everybody, act nice. Um, here's what happened on Saturday. So Saturday, you know, I got this suburban for twelve hundred bucks. That's by far the cheapest suburban in the world. Plus, it wasn't wrecked. Plus, it had the four fifty four. Plus, it had the four wheel drive. Plus, it had the three quarter ton. So. It was exactly what I wanted, and it made it so I could sell the Forerunner and the F-250 because it replaced both of them. Okay, so anyways, I had a radiator problem. So what happened was Saturday, Chuck and Rudy and one of my top wrenches from last year came over and uh, pulled the radiator out. And, of course, I had the wrong freaking radiator. <laughs> So I called up CarQuest and I said, hey, do you have this radiator? And they're like, no, we'll have to order it for Monday. And I was like, great. So anyways, uh, we looked at the belt, the serpentine belt, saw it was bad. So we went ahead and replaced that. That was 39 bucks, 36 bucks, something like that. Uh, replaced the master cylinder. I don't think it was bad, but it's bitching now. Uh, replaced the master cylinder, which was 45 bucks my price, probably 90 bucks list. And... Chuck actually found what the actual problem was with the brakes. I don't know if I told you, but I was coming into the driveway and I stepped on the brake pedal. It went all the way to the floor. And fortunately, before I hit the gate, I remembered that there was the parking brake. So I pushed down that pedal and it stopped mm -hmm. in time. Thank God I was driving it. What happened was, you know, the brake arm goes like this. It's got the pedal on the bottom. Well, it's got a little pin coming out that goes to the push rod of the master cylinder. Well, the clip fell off the end of it, so the push rod came off the pin. So you step on the brakes, and it just went to, all the way to the floor. Okay, so we replaced the master cylinder. We, notice I said we, Chuck. Um, there's this thing, which, the interlock. so you, yeah, it's the interlock so that you can only shift out of park if your foot's on the brake. Chucky yeah. boy! Quack. Okay, so. How does it work? We've got a brake on off switch, right? On the brake pedal that turns on the brake lights, for instance. Anyway, it sends a signal to the PCM, the powertrain control module. Powertrain control module controls the solenoid. As you can see, there is a hole right there in the interlock. And when the vehicle's in park, the solenoid sticks a pin in so you can't move this thing. Then when you, when the PCM says that your foot's on the brake, now all of a sudden you can move this. This part's connected to the shifter, so now you can shift in any gear you want. So we want to talk about that at some point. But that got fixed. The master cylinder got changed. And then when we did, we found out that the bleeder screws on the front calipers were both clogged. So I had to go down there. I actually made four trips to the parts store. Fortunately, it was pretty close. But made four trips to the parts store. Um, that brings up a question that I, a, a point that I want to make. Remember, if we're going to six to nine, it's going to be hard to find parts. So don't assume that we can go in there and then go out and buy parts. Now, here's the most important thing about going on a parts run. Do us both a favor, do us all a favor. And when you go on a parts run, don't go get a freaking sandwich. Don't go get a freaking pizza. Don't go get a whole bunch of stuff because your car is going to be on the lift and it's going to be holding up a whole bunch of other people and they're going to be pissed if you come back with a half-eaten sandwich and you've had your car on the lift for 45 minutes because you decided to get something to eat. So we're going to want to eat before we get there. Now, if, you, if you're dying of thirst, you need to get a soda, whatever, that's fine. But just be aware that when you're on the lift, you're, you're blocking that lift for someone else's use, potentially probably. Um, so anyways, so we replaced the master cylinder, we replaced the bleeder screws, we replaced the serpentine belt. And what happened was we found out the radiator was wrong. So we had to wait on the radiator. Chuck, come in, Chuck came in on Monday and banged it back together. But that radiator was 360 bucks, my cost, 530 list for a 22 year old vehicle. Now you say, well, didn't you spend like $700, $600 on parts? Yeah, I did. You ask yourself, well, why'd you spend $600 on parts for a 22-year-old vehicle that you bought for $1,200? Well, remember, I also bought the catalytic converter and I bought some used tires too. So I've pretty much, I've probably spent $2,500 on it by now. Okay, how does that make sense? Well, that makes sense because no matter what vehicle you buy off of up or up in Craigslist, you don't know anything about it it's probably got significant problems as well. So what do we do when we buy a used car? 
and especially in the context of this class, what do you do? What we do is we look at all the problems the vehicle has and we start picking them off one by one, right? We start picking them off one by one, uh, ranked in importance and what we can afford and you know ease and stuff like that. And eventually we get to the point where we have a reliable vehicle that does what we want it to do. Now the engine's good in that, the transmission's good, the transaxle's good, the brakes have been recently gone through. I mean, it's starting to be a extraordinarily reliable vehicle like it was always taken care of, which it evidently wasn't. So now it'll pass smog legally. I mean, it's, it's, it's turning into a nice vehicle. Now, I doubt I'm gonna drive this vehicle another 50,000 miles in my lifetime. It's got 170,000 on it now, but you know, it could do 50,000 easy, 50,000 more easy. I don't think I'm gonna drive it that much, but if I want to, or if I need to, it'll be available for that. And after all, remember my focus, my number one focus when it comes to transportation is reliable transportation. I can't freaking stand stuff that doesn't start up when I want it to. That leaves you stranded. Go, right? Yeah, it leaves you stranded. I mean, that's, I just can't freaking stand it. Yeah. So everything else is just gravy after that. Now there's a couple of other things that need to be done on that. Like for instance, we found out that the connector to the right side tail light is bad. So now my brake lights don't work and my turn signals don't work, but I guess they probably haven't worked for a long time. But that connector, incidentally, Rudy, is that connector like $22? It sounds about right. Brutal, man. That makes no sense at all, except, you know. But, no but it's because it's so popular and it's such a common thing that goes out on them. Yeah, true that. Okay. So, so they know they, they know you're going to pay it to get it fixed. Right. So they can just charge you whatever the hell they want at any point. Bad design. Yeah. Because the only one CarQuest had was the AC Delco and it was 50 bucks. I'm like, what the hell? Oh so I got this at 22 at, from eBay. You know, it's 25 for standard. You know, it's like, okay, I don't get super Chinese stuff. Bless you. I don't get super Chinese stuff, but, you know, everything's made in China anyway. So, well, almost everything. So we still need to get that done. Now, since we put the new belt on it, now it's got a squeaky squeak. I didn't get under the hood to find out whether that's an idler or a tensioner. But, you know, we just keep making steps, step after step after step. We need to change the resistor in the blower motor, blower motor. which is kind of, which is kind of, it's, it's a job for small hands. Let's put it that way. And uh, I started checking out the blower doors. I mean, the, the heater and air codes, and I'm not sure that those are working correctly, but you know, what the hell? We're so much further along than we were last week or whatever. And that after all is the theme of the class, right? We wanna be significantly further along this week than we were last week. And after all, we've got the resources. Now we're gonna get four new snap-on scanners top of the line scanners and all that, you know, all that stuff. Uh, it's really nice. We're going to get almost $100,000 worth of snap on training. So that's going to be torque measurement and uh, battery starting and charging and scan tools. And I think meters. So we're going to be freaking set. It's going to be groovy, very, very groovy. Can't wait. So what we want to do is really, as we're looking at towards the end of the semester, we want to focus on making sure our vehicles are going to last all summer without any major service, really. So we're going to want to make sure we get the oil changed before we leave and stuff like that. Because, you know, most of us are driving used cars. And, you know, like Mr. Burks is, you know, running a fleet, basically. So what we want to do is we want to bring each car in and rotate it because what happens when you put it on a car, a car on a lift is you discover a bunch of stuff that you wouldn't discover any other way, right? Plus a whole bunch of service possibilities end up um, um, arise that you would never consider otherwise, like changing all the fuel filters. If I was you, Mr. Burks, I would change the fuel filters in every car you got. Well, we got it up in the air. It's really easy. It's really quick. And we got the tools. It's really easy and quick. And what's going to happen is when we get these cars up in the air. And they're cheap. Yeah. And what happens is when we get all your cars up in the air, we're going to discover some stuff that you never would have discovered any other way. Like Anna Maria with that Subaru, right? Wasn't it a Subaru last year? 
Yeah. And you discover a whole bunch of stuff that you never would have known. And then we can start putting it in the queue so that we can say, okay, well, maybe we can't fix it this week. Maybe you need to get some parts or maybe you need to, you know, further diagnosis or something like that. And, you know, we've got, you know, four weeks in April and probably two weeks in May. So there is a, a certain time constraint, but what we want to do is we want to bring in every vehicle we can and do as much as we can. You know, we start with undercar inspection, brake inspection, pull the wheels off, look underneath, looking to do an engine compartment inspection, right? And so we can start making a list in our head of and a strategy on how we're going to address whatever things we find. And we will find them. Now, do I care if you bring in your neighbor's car, or your wife's car, or Sancho's car? No, I don't care. Um, but you, we just want to stay busy. And uh, one thing I would like is to get that freaking red Corvette, which has been down for a year. I would like to get that down the road. And actually, I would pay handsomely to see that happen. Yes, I Me would. Me and Chuck. Okay. Me and Chuck, as soon as we hit that shop. Right, Chuck? That's right. Okay. Well, I hope you don't mind big stacks of cash because... I'm hell yeah. yeah. That might hurt me, but I think I'll, I'll sacrifice for the team. <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, the Z06, I'm daily driving now, and that Z06 is not supposed to be daily driven. And you lose a lot of value when you take a car like that and daily drive it. So the red Corvette was supposed to be the daily driver, and that's what I need to get back to. Anyways, so that's a bunch of good news, and I wanted to make sure that you were aware of it so you could start planning because, after all, we got next week and then comes spring break. So no, two weeks. No, next week and then comes spring break. Yeah, so uh, time is running short. So let's get after it. Now, Michelle, if you uh, would rather spend $1,000 for a break job, you're more than welcome. Uh, yeah, Michelle's like, no. Well, my break's are already done. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll I have a lot of other stuff though. Right, yeah. So, <laughs> We will uh, see what, how good of a job they did, right? Yeah. So that's good. So all these cars, start start making your plans. Start to start figuring yeah. out how to stay busy. And as I say, I'm going to fight for the Tuesday and the Thursday, but we need to make sure that we keep that shop full. Now, I don't think that they're going to come by because after all, that would be coming by on their own time. But right. they might, you know. So... Uh, are we going to be doing the six foot distancing thing? Well, we're certainly going to try. And, you know, maybe I'll talk to you later a little bit more detail about that. But, you know, that's that's the expectation. So anyways, I did want to talk to you about this little thing right here, which is a solenoid. What do you know about a solenoid? A solenoid is an electromagnetic device. It's got a coil, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. And since it's got a coil, in order to get current flow, that coil must have continuity. But we know that a continuity tester usually doesn't work over 50. Come on, feet. don't destroy my leads. Right? Yeah. So yeah. What? It's just so crowded in here. Oh, did you know? Okay, here's the worst part. The way they're planning on doing schooling in person is the students are supposed to come to school, they're supposed to sit at their desks, and they're supposed to watch the class on their Chromebooks. They're not even supposed to look at the whiteboard. Why? Because that way they can shoot it to the, um, the students that aren't at class. Oh, I see. But that's complicated. Yeah. No, this is this is crazy. Good luck with all of that stuff. Yeah, this is crazy. So, okay, why can't they just have a class of teacher that's taking care of the kids that don't come, and then a class with the regular setup? Money. For instance, look. You don't me. reason go out the. <laughs> I'm, so sorry. I'm an auto teacher. I'm the only auto teacher, so if I don't teach, if I don't, if I'm not teaching it, nobody else is going to know how. Um. So well, yes, that's true. I mean, I'll find a better way, but. Yeah, that's how crazy stuff is. They've already revamped the schedule twice. They're, I mean, it's just, it's out of control. Yeah. All right, so we're trying to test this solenoid to see if it works. Now, of course, if I had my power probe out, I could just, you know, run 12 volts across it and see if it goes click, click, click. That would be the best way because that's an active test as opposed to the passive test that I'm about to show you. The passive test says, okay, the coil has got to have resistance, right? It's got to have continuity. 
and it's got these two leads. Uh oh, it's got these two leads. Ah, come on now. There we go. Share screen right there. And we go to advanced over here like this. There we go. It's got this coil and there's the two leads right there. So if I put 12 volts across those leads, the solenoid should activate. Okay, so I've set my ohm meter on ohms. And of course, since there's no continuity between these two leads. It reads open loop, infinite resistance, out of range, whatever. It means the resistance is so high, the meter can't even measure it. Now, every time I'm using ohm meters, and usually it's a good idea anyways, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put the leads together and make sure that I have good leads. Now, as you can see, I don't really have really good leads. Now, can you see that I'm not getting a consistent reading? Mm -hmm. That means I'm not pushing it hard enough. There's corrosion on the leads. But you can see that it's about two ohms, three ohms. Okay, so you know that the leads probably need to be replaced. They've got resistance to them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my, my ohm meter across these two leads in here. And I should get some kind of ohm meter reading. So let me try that now like this, I'm sorry you can't see it. And I get 59 ohms. Does that have continuity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 59.2 ohms. Yeah. Now, whether it's 57 or 62, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that if I put 12 volts across it, current will flow. Now, does that mean that the pokey thing will stick out? Not necessarily, but usually it does. I mean, the pokey thing can get, you know, the plunger can get stuck, that's true, or the return spring could be broken. But in general, that's the first uh, test you want to do on this if you don't have a power probe. Now, I got a power probe, but it was recently put away beautifully into a box that was really too small for it. So if I get the power probe out, it's going to be hell getting it back in. So I don't want to use it. Anyway, my point was, that's how you test the solenoid. It's just like any other just like any other coil, that's how you're going to test it. Yeah. So you can see what we've been what we've been working towards all this year. Uh, I've gotten a couple of requests, a couple of questions on this. I'm going to tell you again. The correct scanner to buy is the Kizy K Z Y E E 301 K C 301, and that's about 55 bucks on Amazon. That's what you should do. That's going to get you in the game, and it's going to set you up. If you've got if you got an OBD2 car, you should have one because these shops around here, oh, they're crazy. They're crazy. They're absolutely crazy. I would be very, very scared and nervous about taking my car to any place around here that wasn't Chafee Adult School. Um, we have been talking about the history of emission controls. And the reason I talk about the history of emission controls is it's important to see the progression we may actually get through it tonight. Let me see. This is, golly, about to finish this. Let me see. Mission systems. Oh, I wanted to check because I was afraid maybe. Okay, let me check. Road draft tube. That's not the world's best drawing. My drawings keep getting better, but yeah, you know what? Let's go back and do this better. All right, that's a valve cover, VC. This is a cylinder head, that's a CH. This is an intake manifold, that's a IM. That's a CH, which is a cylinder head. And then on top of this is the valve cover, of course. This is the engine block. And over here is the air filter housing. I think I was in too big of a rush doing this last time. Okay, right here is the breather filter. Breather filter. This thing right here is the breather tube.
And the name of the system is positive crankcase ventilation. Did I write that down? Yeah, I did, okay. Now, let's review so you understand how it works. There's a valve right here. If there's pressure in the crankcase, oh, incidentally, I have the best animation. Oh my God, I have the best animation and I just discovered it by accident. So check this out and you will realize why they pay me the big bucks, quack. Um, where is it? Right there. Best animation ever. Chuck, you're not going to believe this. Watch. Blow by. All blow by is blow by past the rings, right? So this shows you the two types of blow by. There's blow by on the compression stroke. That's on the left. You can see as the piston goes up, Pressure is getting past the rings and going into the crankcase, which is this part right here. That's the piston. That's the crank, the connecting rod. Best animations ever. I have no idea why I got this lucky, but I did. As the rings leak, we get pressure inside the crankcase. What makes the rings leak? Well, they've got compression rings, two of them. But the problem is, as the cylinder bore wears, the gap at the end of the compression rings increases. As a result, there's more places for pressure to escape. And the more worn out the engine gets, the more leakage you're gonna get. That's called blow-by, blow-by past the rings. Now there's two types of blow-by. There's the blow-by that happens on the compression stroke. That's what you see on the left. And there's the blow-by that happens on the combustion stroke. That's what you see on the right. And these animations are freaking insanely great. They show you exactly what's going on. Because the important thing you need to understand is that we're pressurizing this crankcase, and they call it a crankcase because it's the case with the crankshaft in it. It's pressurizing the crankcase, which is pressurizing the whole inside of the engine, which will cause problems like ring flutter and stuff like that. But usually the problem we're going to see is that we're going to start getting oil leaks at the oil pan. We're going to start getting oil leaks at the valve cover gaskets because those gaskets are not for pressure. They're just supposed to sit there. And as a result, what happens is they start blowing oil out of the gaskets, which is why a lot of times when they have a significant oil coming out of these gaskets, I'm going to strongly suggest to you that you might want to consider the PCV system isn't working correctly. Now, as you can see, I'm going to go back. As you can see here, 1964, this was the first emissions control system, really. As you can see, it's got a PCV valve. Every valve controls flow. And what the PCV valve does is, this is a big vacuum hose. That's got a lot of suction to it. We got to make sure that that valve is working correctly. And that valve is going to be calibrated for this engine. You need to understand that. You can't just put any old valve in it. So what's going to happen is when the crankcase gets pressurized, it's going to blow this valve off the seat and all that oil mist, which is what's inside the crankcase, all that pressurized oil mist, instead of going out to the atmosphere like it did on the road draft tube, it's going to go into the intake manifold where it's going to go into the cylinders and get burned. It's not a great solution, but that's the best solution we had. Because remember, engines used to only last like 100,000 miles. And then they were dead. Now it's like, my my silver C5 had 205,000 miles on it and it was freaking awesome. It was like good as new because we're a lot better at it now. Okay, so. Ramp is 355 and still runs like new. Now, here's the thing. This is a PCV valve. Do yourself a favor. When you buy a new used car, get yourself a new PCV valve and get yourself a new fuel filter. These are things that never get changed that you really need to change. Now, can you clean this out with a throttle body cleaner? Yeah, you can. I don't suggest it because you don't know what's going on inside. And remember, this valve has got to be calibrated in order for everything to run right. So just get, you know, they're like six, eight bucks. Now, do you think that Spectrum is going to last throughout my beautiful lecture? I hope so. Hope so. You know, Frontier just came out with a, an offer with fiber optic, 500 up, 500 down instead of 400 down and 20 up. So I was like, okay, Spectrum, you asked for it. You know, I've, I've lost Spectrum. I lose Spectrum like two or three times a week. Anyways, maybe I shouldn't say that on a government website, but it's true. 
So my point was, change that PCV valve. Now, almost every car has a PCV valve. How do you test the PCV valve? Well, there's a couple of ways, but inside your crankcase, when you take off your oil filler cap, which is gonna tell you crankcase pressure, when you take off the oil filler cap, there should be a slight vacuum in the engine. And the classic test is, you put this over the hole where the oil filler cap was, and it should hold the paper down. Shouldn't be a strong vacuum, but should be a slight vacuum. And that's based on the calibration of this and the fact that you've got this big old vacuum hose sucking to it. That's the classic test. Now, if you've got pressure when you pull off that oil filler cap, chances are good you got a lot of blow by. But the weird part was I had a 2001 Nissan Frontier. I pulled off the oil filler cap at like 20,000 miles and it was but that's a, it's a shorthand way to check to see if this engine's worn out. Take off the oil filler cap while the engine's running and you should have a slight vacuum. It shouldn't be going because all that pressure came from where? Came from blow by, blow by past the rings, which usually denotes either the rings are jacked up or it's got uh, um, worn out cylinders which have increased the ring gap. Um, so here's the thing about that. If the amount of blow by, if the amount of crankcase pressure exceeds the ability of this hose to generate, to uh, um, deal with it all, you're going to get reversion in this breather tube. Accurate. And what's going to happen is it's going to start dumping oil into this breather filter. So that's another way to tell something about the engine is take off this air filter housing. I'm specifically thinking of Ford's. Take off the top of this air filter housing and check this breather filter. People never change it. You should though, but people never change it. And it does give you a pretty good uh, indication of whether you've got a real blow by issue. If you got a significant blow by issue on an engine, I would probably pass on it. Now, is it possible that you can use Marvel Mystery Oil to free up the rings and it might work? Yeah, it might work. Might, might not though. So that would be my concern, put it that way. So almost every car has a PCV system. Unfortunately on the Corvettes, it's on the back. It's like this big old convoluted issue to find it. Now, if the PCV hose is bad, <clears throat> how will you know? Well, it's a vacuum hose, right? So if this vacuum hose has a leak in it, I mean, remember, what are the enemies of a hose? Heat and oil, right? It's right on top of the engine. So if you've got a hole on that, and we, we had this on actually on two of the C5s, how are you going to know? Well, because all that vacuum leaking in, all the air leaking in is going to skew your long-term fuel trim way lean. And your fuel trim is going to go way positive to try to compensate for that. So that's how. Now, how can you tell if you got a vacuum leak? Get in there with some brake cleaner and start spraying it around. Now, Nate Davis was doing it with water. Water's cool and all, but the problem with water is it's not as violent, plus it's not pressurized. I like using brake cleaner. I used to use throttle body cleaner, but it kind of leaves a film. I like using brake cleaner because it's very, it's pressurized, it's really quick and evaporates away clean. So we spray the vacuum hoses to see if we got some kind of leak. And if you do have some kind of leak, when you're spraying it with brake cleaner, what's going to happen is the engine RPM is going to go up. You say, ah, oh, okay. In fact, that's how we found the vacuum leak on Rudy's Cobra, by spraying it with brake cleaner at where the intake manifold match, meets the head, and it would go vroom. Like, okay. We ended up replacing the O-rings and the injectors, hoping that that was it, so we wouldn't have to take the intake manifold off, but that didn't fix it. That, that wasn't it. it. That wasn't it, right. right. Cost me quite a bit, but that wasn't it. I know, and the worst part was I told Rudy, look, just take some Permatex and... <whistles> He's like, oh, no, I must do it right. I'm like, okay, okay, buddy. Um, Though I admire people that do things right. Um, there's a time and a place. Uh, anyway, but my she runs like a dream now. Right. Yeah, which is groovy. Which is groovy. I just need to find someone to do a top. Um, maybe you can get someone to take it down to TJ. But I guess they charge you duty now on if you take the top down there, they charge you duty on the value of the top. So 
Um, just take the car down there and have them do the top and the interior down there yeah. with the material they have right. and then bring it back. That way I don't pay no duty on nothing. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, my point was, <clears throat> yeah, my point was that that's the positive crankcase ventilation system. I strongly suggest if you buy a new used car that you go and get it. Speaking of new used cars, one of my students went out just to show you what, why we did what we did at the beginning of the year. One of my students' moms went out and got a 2014 Scion XD, right? Like this. No, not like that. Like this. There you go. Scion XD. Now, a Scion's a Toyota, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Scion XD is not a popular car. It's not a car that everybody wants. As a result, the price is down, right? Because if the supply remains constant and the demand goes down, the price goes down as well, yeah? So as a result, the Scion is a cheap car to buy, but it's still a Toyota. So they got this car for what, 7,500, I think? It's a 2014 with 46,000 miles on it. Can you imagine getting a Toyota with 46,000 miles? That's like barely broken in. I mean, it's got probably another 200,000 miles still left for you. Yeah. So, so this was a great, this was a great purchase. I, they probably could have got it cheaper, but they wanted to get it from a dealer. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a civilian. It's not someone who has shop access. But I wanted to suggest to you that when you go looking for vehicles, rather than looking for what everybody else likes, look for stuff that other people don't usually look for, like Mazda 3s. The Mazda 3 is a great car, but it's not popular like the Accord, Civic, and you know Corolla. As a result, the prices are way down. Since everybody doesn't want it, that brings the price down for a wonderful car. Like the Ford Probe was a wonderful car in that regard. It wasn't really popular, but it was a great car. It was made by... Pink made Probe. Probe. Yeah, who made the Probe? Uh, Mitsubishi, right? No. Yes. No Ford. Mazda, Mazda, that's who it was. Yeah, it was Ford. So it was, it was a, it was basically a Mazda with Ford badges on it, which made it a great car. So that's what I'm thinking about. That watch out for trying to do what everyone else does, because that's when you pay full price, right? Like we said, like we've been talking about real estate. When everyone else is yeah. buying, you want to be selling. Yeah, exactly. And when everybody else is getting the Accords and Civics, that probably adds like a thousand dollars to the price. Um, while we're on that topic, I was watching uh, People's Court, and these people bought this car for $3,600. It was like a 2004 Accord. They bought it for like $3,600. On the drive home, the thing blew up. Head gaskets. Now, the, the people that sold it are like on People's Court, like, well, we didn't know it had a problem. Okay. So the head gaskets just spontaneously blew up, right? Okay, so anyways, that wasn't the important point. The important point was she had this freaking car towed to a Honda dealer. Oh, Lord. And mm. then she had them replace the motor. Oh. <laughs> $4,500 she mm. put into this car. So now she's into this car for like 8000 something dollars. And she, now she's suing the seller. Uh, yeah, I want you to pay for the new engine. That's judge, not gonna... is like, mm. judge is like... No, 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 creo. right? So it was dumb. It was dumb, dumb to dumb. This is what happens. You see, I mean, if you're if you're dumb about cars, you're gonna get freaking wrecked. That's an easy way to get wrecked. So that's why we take a class like this, right? Um, okay, so I wanted to talk to you about that just so you understood what the stakes were. My beautiful blow by uh yeah. Oh, Jocko, Jocko's got, Jocko's got this guy. I think this guy's interesting. Jocko, whatever his name is, Jocko yeah. Willink. Yeah, he's good. He used to be an officer in the SEALs. Mm -hmm. He's got a whole bunch of interesting videos, right? Like the uh, uh, guide to waking up early. Mm -hmm. uh, nine core characteristics that mark an individual for having high potential. He's got a video called Get After It. You know, I, I just saw this guy today, so I, I thought it was interesting, but he looked had a bunch of stuff that looked pretty interesting. So I was going to suggest it to you. Maybe it's worth a look. Uh, let's go back and get here. 
and it's time like pleasure. a lot of motivational talking. Yeah, well, I mean, let's listen to successful people. Let's quit listening to people that are marginally. I mean, that's the that's the big problem with TikTok is you got all these 26 year olds that don't have driver's licenses that are giving life advice. Hey, no, people in their 40s and 50s are doing TikToks too. <laughs> right, and it's like, okay, well, let's see how successful you are first. Yeah. And the problem is, Modern media, like the the radio people listen to, it's like the people that they th they think are successful, they're just feeding them the same fake news that we've been talking about as far as this COVID goes. They're saying this is how you be successful: deal drugs. This is how you. This is what you. This is what successful people do. They buy eight hundred dollar bottles of champagne, right? And it just completely misleads the kids. It's like, and it, it's, I mean, well. I mean, it's not it's not their job. I mean, if we believe in capitalism, we have to understand it's not their job to raise your kids for you. You know, they're there to make they're there to sell records. Yeah, it's entertainment. Yeah, you know. So, you know, it's like, do you really expect you know the glam glam metal bands to raise your kids? If 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 these bands are raising your kids, then you're in trouble. Something. Yes, everybody's in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> second. Second uh, small uh, uh, um, system was the air injector reactor, which is the secondary air. Now, what we have is an air pump that's being driven by a belt off the pulley. This is when, this is when people really hated smog equipment. Real quick, can you what? get the check valves for the Cobra? What did you say? The check valves for the secondary air system. Yeah, of course. I mean, why couldn't you? you? Can you see about getting those for me and I'll give you the cash? Because I need to change them in the Cobra. Why don't you call CarQuest and see? Because you got, you got the hookup, I don't. You've got the exact same hookup I've got, dude. Just tell them you're from Chafee Adult School or Montclair. Right on Sunday. And I got the hookup. Right? Yep. Right? Pay 50%. Right? Okay, so here's the thing. We got a one-way valve here. When that one-way valve goes bad, all the hot air coming out of the exhaust goes back here and it kills your pump. So if your pump dies, suspect the one-way valve is bad. It's driven off a belt off the crankshaft and it's gonna blow air into the exhaust manifold and that air is gonna be there. The exhaust manifolds are plenty hot enough that the oxygen in that air is gonna hopefully combine with leftover hydrocarbons that didn't get burned. Remember hydrocarbon is unburned fuel and it's going to go ahead and burn the hydrocarbons and that's going to give us better emissions, especially down less hydrocarbons. Now, are we getting any value out of the burning of hydrocarbons? No, but we're getting lower emissions. Now there's also a air pump that blows into the catalytic converter on many cars and it performs the same function just so you know. On many cars, it goes to the catalytic converter instead of going to the exhaust manifold. But people hated this system because it made it so we started burning a lot of spark plug wires, that's for sure. Because if you didn't put the spark plug wires in looms the way they were supposed to be and be very, very careful about how you put the spark plug wires, you would end up running against all this plumbing. It, it made it hard to get the spark plugs in and out and it also made it so we were burning a lot of spark plug wires, which you already know are the most vulnerable, unreliable parts of the whole engine anyway. So this was going to lower the emissions of hydrocarbons, which is good and useful. So this was really going after the emissions. This was just going after you know hydrocarbons coming out of the engine, but this was going after the actual emissions. And this is when people started hating smog controls because after all this pump does take horsepower to run, probably 10 to 15 horsepower to run this pump and the plumbing issues. All right, number three was transmission controlled spark. The problem with transmission controlled spark was you would get no vacuum advance until high gear, whatever it was, it wouldn't give you advance. As a result, it was going to control the NOx because in 1970, we started going after oxides of nitrogen. Oxides of nitrogen is created by high combustion temperatures and the combustion temperatures were higher when we had 
vacuum, what's called vacuum advance, which is sensitive to engine load, it would give us spark sooner, which would increase combustion temperatures and make the engine more, run more efficiently. Are you ready for this? This is the sentence straight out of Terry Smith's mouth. Vacuum advance is all about part throttle fuel economy. You're at part throttle a lot. But the problem was it started giving us NOx problems. So we started controlling that and guess what? As a result, what happened to fuel economy? It went down. So now people are starting to understand the relationship between emission controls and fuel economy sucking because it started to suck. Number four, catalytic converter. Now the catalytic converter is made of platinum and palladium, which means it's gonna be expensive, one. Number two, you can't use leaded fuel. So we had to go to unleaded, which was way more expensive because we used to use lead for the octane and now we can't use lead anymore. So we have to use more expensive stuff to get the octane. So the price of the gas went up, the price of the cars went up, now we're starting to see, you know, $1,000 on every car is being spent just on emission controls. But you know what I remembered today? I went to an elementary school in Glendora. My elementary school was a mile from the mountains, from the foothills in Glendora. And the smog used to be so bad. I was in kindergarten in 1969. The smog used to be so bad, you couldn't see the mountains, even though they were a mile away. That's a true story. We used to have first stage smog alerts all the time where the kids couldn't even go out and play. They had to stay in the classroom. It was terrible. The 60s was terrible. If you were in this area, you, re you remember the, si the 60s was terrible. I mean, you couldn't see the mountains and they were a mile away. And that, we used to get first stage smog alerts all the time, all the time. Yeah. Now, I mean, sometimes the smog gets bad, but it's nothing even remotely close to what we had. So there has been significant improvement now, do you know where most of the smog in LA comes from? China. Yep, that's right. It blows straight over. I mean, they don't care. I mean, they built more coal-fired coal power plants last year than the whole rest of the world combined. You know, yeah, and when they had the lockdown, the smog improved so much. Yeah, right? Yeah. But smog is a sign of economic activity, you know, so that's what we have to watch out for because you know this if they want to use climate as a reason to lock down people i mean we've already seen how submissive people were the first time yeah you know, that's first really time of practice for next time yep all right so it's going to convert the hc and co which is unburned fuel and partially burned fuel it's going to con convert that into water and co2 which is way better Okay, but here's the thing about the catalytic converter. Remember, this is way before onboard diagnostics. So if you had, you know, I mean, back in the day when you broke a spark plug wire or a spark plug quit working, your engine would run rough and you would have, you know, seven cylinders worth of power instead of eight and the idle speed would be low, but you could drive it around for a long time until you got enough money to, you know, fix that issue. The problem with the catalytic converter is if you have a ignition failure in a cylinder, you've got all this raw fuel coming into the cylinder and all that raw fuel is coming straight out of the cylinder and it's headed straight for the catalytic converter, which is not built to process raw fuel. As a result, it gets clogged. And as it gets clogged, now all of a sudden you can't pass smog anymore, but the bigger and more important part is you've killed that catalytic converter and it's going to be hundreds of dollars to fix back when hundreds of dollars was a lot back when cars used to cost three thousand dollars so people were very very upset about this catalytic converter thing we as i say we didn't have obed so you know you could drive around for ten thousand miles with a spark plug not firing and all it would do is kill your catalytic converter plug it up and now you've got exhaust restriction so now your fuel economy takes a dump your power takes a dump your drivability takes a dump and your emissions take a dump. So the catalytic converter, see, people are just getting angrier and angrier as they should because everything we did to fix smog made the engine run worse. PCV didn't, but everything after that did. Okay, now we're just gonna keep getting worse. Number five, lean burn. Lean burn says, okay, now we're gonna get lean mixtures. We're going to lean out the mixtures. Okay, the problem with that is 
you know, you can run a little rich and everything's fine. But if you run the least bit too lean, you know what you get? The engine goes, but, 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 it bucks really hard. You start having drivability problems. You start having stalls, stumbling, engine dying, really bad stuff. And we didn't really have the technology to do the lean burn correctly. So as a result, we started having real significant problems and the cars sucked. Meanwhile, you know, the Asian manufacturers are saying, no, we're going to build small cars so we can build small engines. And they had, at this point, much better, much better cars. Because the domestic manufacturers were convinced that everybody would not want to get rid of their big cars. And sad to say, for the most part, it was true. People got used to the big cars and they didn't want to get the small cars. Remember the Vega and all those other small cars, the Pinto? When the American manufacturers tried to make small cars, people were like, meh. Okay, so here's the problem. Lean mixtures, that created detonation, of course. That created loss of power and real drivability problems. But what we were trying to do is we were trying to cut down on this HC and CO emissions. All right. Number six, electronic carburetors. What a freaking nightmare that was. We put what's called a mixture control solenoid in a regular carburetor, like a Rochester Quadrajet, but we didn't really know what we were doing. And it's basically a solenoid and it would just go like this, duty cycle, you know, pulse width modulated, and it would push in fuel like basically, well, a very, very primitive um, fuel injector. But these electronic carburetors were like $900 and nobody knew how to rebuild them. Everybody was scared of them because they came with oxygen sensors and who the hell knows what that means, right? This is, this is the beginning of oxygen sensors. This is the beginning of computer control. Now, I skipped something which I shouldn't have skipped, but we already talked about evaporative emissions. So let me just review this for a moment and we'll get to the important part that is going to make you very sad or make you very happy that those days are over. Evaporative emissions. What they did was in order to test the emissions of a vehicle, they put it in a closed room and then they let it sit and see what kind of emissions it was coming out. And of course, we were getting emissions out of the upholstery, off gassing. We were getting emissions off the paint, but that wasn't the big problem. The big problem was we were getting emissions out of the gas tank and out of the carburetor. Because you run the engine and the carburetor had these things called float bowls, which were just bowls full of fuel, like your toilet bowl. And after you stop the engine, the engine's still hot, the carburetor's on the top of the engine, and all the fuel in those float bowls would just evaporate. And they found out that these cars were creating more emissions off of evaporation than they were coming out of the tailpipe. So then we started having sealed gas caps and we started having charcoal canisters and we started having, having these evaporative emission systems which had a bunch of valves and a bunch of vacuum hoses all over the place, which was pretty nightmarish. And we started having this situation where we had 17 million vacuum lines, vacuum lines all over the car, vacuum valves all over the car. And remember, what we did with the electronics is we replaced all these vacuum lines and all these vacuum valves. But before that, how the hell are you supposed to know what's supposed to be happening in these vacuum lines or if it's correct or anything like that? Because we had no onboard diagnostics. So it was nightmarish. It was disastrous. And the reason you don't see these cars is because nobody knew how to fix them. Really, nobody knew how to fix them. They weren't worth fixing. When they started having problems, nobody knew how to diagnose them. And eventually you start spending enough time on diagnosing them and you've exceeded the value of the vehicle. So that's HC and CO with the catalytic converter. That's HC and CO off the lean burn ignition. And that's HC coming out of the evaporative emissions because HC is unburned fuel. But the biggest problem that we haven't talked about is What's that, number eight? Yeah, number eight. Number eight is lower compression ratios. And this is really what broke America's heart. 
And this was all about NOx. Oxides of nitrogen is created by, because nitrogen, remember, is an inert gas. I mean, nitrogen they use in welding. It's typically an inert gas. Inert meaning it's not reactive. But if you get the compression, and I mean, sorry, the combustion temperatures high enough, it starts to react and make funky things like oxides of nitrogen, NOx. And the reason they call it NOx is because it could be NO3, could be NO4, we don't know. Depends on the combustion process. But high combustion temperatures are created by high compression. So in 1970, the, three, the 454 had 10.25 to 1 compression. The 454, let's say, well, the good 454 had 11 to 1 compression. 454, that's the cubic inches. 454, 1970, had 11 to 1 compression. 11 to 1 compression, and it had 450 horsepower as a result. Now, 454 in 1973 had eight and a half to one compression and it had 185 horsepower. Now it still drank gas like a 454, but can you see why people lost their faith in American manufacturing? Because like I said, these 454s, you would find them in every station wagon. So I would go to pick apart and it would be 454s up and down the row, which was great if you like big blocks. But the problem was these motors were freaking dogs. You know, it's like you'd, you'd have this big old station wagon that would get eight miles a gallon because it's got a 454 in it. And you could barely go up a hill with this big old car filled with kids or, you know, presents or camping or whatever towing a trailer you probably couldn't even go to the speed limit that's because we lowered the compression ratio in order to deal with this nox issue and we did this for years years probably close to 10 years we kept lowering the compression ratio and the problem was the power kept going and when the power kept going now all of a sudden you've got this car that can't even get out of its way it's super super slow but that was to deal with oxides of nitrogen emissions. Really destroyed. Now, in the Z06, I've got 11 point something, 11.3 to one compression, which is insanely high. It's probably the highest compression you can find in a modern vehicle. But that requires premium fuel all the time, no questions. Because if it doesn't have that premium fuel, the NOx sensors are going to freaking act up. And then it's going to retard the timing until the NOx goes away. So you're going to end up losing power anyway. Is that like the same type of ratio that's in the Cobra then? I don't know. Isn't the Cobra like 10 and a quarter or something like that? I don't know, but I know it requires premium fuel all yeah. the time. Right, right. So here's the thing. You don't want to put a supercharger on an engine that's got 11.3 to 1 compression. I don't think, you know, unless you want to spray parts all over the road. So anything that's got a supercharger is going to have lower compression, like 9 to 1 maybe. Should be lower than that, but it's going to be way lower than 11. I know that much. So we're dealing with this NOx issue. Now, how are we dealing with hydrocarbons and... Uh, carbon monoxide. Well, besides the catalytic converter, we're also starting to get into precise fuel control, right? Because now we're going from mixture control solenoids in electronic carburetors, we're going to fuel injection. And now we're getting smarter about fuel injection because we're coming up with things like MAP sensors, mass airflow sensors, speed density systems. We're coming up with things like intake air temperature sensors, coolant temperature sensors, oxygen sensors, so now we're starting to get into precise fuel control, but we're still got this NOx problem. And we came to the realization that we can't keep lowering the compression ratios because it just makes the engines total dog. 
Speaking of which, while I was at school last time, I found this. That right there is a vacuum valve for the evaporative emission control system. There's a filter right there for exhaust. I think this is a purge valve. As you can see, it's got two connectors here and it's got a vacuum hose in and a vacuum hose out. If you want, we can see if this valve's any good. Same way we did the solenoid. It's a solenoid valve. So we're gonna put the meter on ohms. We're gonna put the two leads together to make sure. Yep, leads are good. And then I'm gonna come in here like this. Sorry. And we'll put one lead on one side of the solenoid, one lead on the other side of the solenoid. It's 36 ohms. So it's got continuity, which tells us that this will probably work if we apply 12 volts to it. Remember, all actuators are 12 volts. If we apply 12 volts to it, we're going to get current flow and we're probably going to hear it click, click, click. And this is why we spend all this time going over electrical fundamentals. Thank you, Michelle, for the idea, because it was Michelle's idea. This is why we did it because this is, the, this is the power we want to have. Um, incidentally, while I was there, I picked these up. That right there is a fuel pump right there. That's a fuel pump. If I go to these two leads right here, I can see if the pumped windings are good. Hard to do one-handed though. Put this one here. Put this one here. 198 ohms, so the pump's windings are good. Probably the pump is good. If I put 12 volts to it, it'll probably go I'm not sure it'll give you the pressure, but, but at least the windings are good. That right there is an oxygen sensor in case you're wondering what it looks like. Take this little thing off. That's what an oxygen sensor looks like. This one is old and bad. Old and bad, I think, actually, I think this might be out of the Cobra. Uh, it might be out of some kind of Ford. It's got four wires, it's got a ground, it's got a signal, and it's got two heaters, right? Four wires right there. Now, if I wanted to, what I've seen before is you can hook up to the signal and hook up to the ground on a voltmeter or a uh, oscilloscope, and you can run a pro propane torch across this tip, and you can watch the... Maybe I'll do that. That would be nice if I wasn't so freaking lazy. I'd get all kinds of stuff accomplished. True story. Now, this right here is your best friend ever, right there. That's what that's what you love, right there, because the system we're going to talk about right everybody now. Everybody hates it. Everybody hates it. <laughs> that right there is called EGR valve. Everybody hates it, and for a good reason. And I got a pretty good example of why. But we're going to say number nine is exhaust gas. Recirculation, EGR. EGR, number nine. This is all about NOx. This is all about NOx, and this is a <laughs> terrible way of controlling it, but this is what we did. Aimfully, this is what we did. Okay, exhaust gas recirculation is exactly what it sounds like. What it does is we're going to take the exhaust gas and we're going to feed it into the intake. Now, that means that the smoke, that's what exhaust is, the smoke is going to displace fresh air <laughs> because there's less oxygen in the smoke, right? There shouldn't be actually. Like your other way of explaining it. Yeah, so basically it's like taking what comes out of the horse and feeding it to the horse. Now, what's that going to do to the horse? The horse, ain't, the horse is going to be sick and weak. And that's exactly what it does to your engine, too. This exhaust valve, I mean, this EGR valve is going to take exhaust from here. And it's, well, no, it's going to take exhaust from here and it's going to feed it into the intake. And the valve is going to control how much. And it's going to suck because. The more smoke you let into the intake, the worse the engine is going to run. The classic test for the EGR system is you should be able to open the valve all the way and it should be able to kill the engine. So what I would do is I'd come in here with a vacuum pump, a little mighty vac like Chuck's got. I'd put it on this valve, the engine running, 
and I pump, 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 pump up the vacuum, make this valve open all the way, and it should kill the engine. Why? Because if you take what comes out of the horse and feed it to the horse, you're going to end up killing the horse. And that's what we're doing. We're displacing the good stuff with smoke. And that'll end up killing the engine. That's the tip, that's the, the classic test of the EGR system is to put a vacuum pump on this, pump it, pump up, mighty vac, pump it up, pull this valve open, get full smoke flow into the intake manifold, and it should kill the engine. Because this thing is a freaking engine killer. It is. But it allowed us to increase the compression. That's true. So what do we do? We have to finally, finally, not finally, finally control the operation of this valve. For instance, must not operate when engine is cold or at idle. So Chuck, what did we do? We had a thermal vacuum switch in the coolant that wouldn't allow flow to the EGR valve when the engine was cold. We had ported vacuum coming out of the carburetor so that this wouldn't operate when the engine was at idle. A whole bunch of sophisticated uh, vacuum hoses all over the place. Again, we, we got vacuum hoses all over the place so that this would not operate at an idle or when the engine was cold. Why? Because if it operated at an idle or when the engine was cold, it would just kill the engine. So lots of people were very frustrated with this EGR system. And the problem was you couldn't just block it off because it was the, cal the carburetor was calibrated for that system. The fuel injection was calibrated for that system. So it's not like you could just take it off and block it off without some significant shenanigans to compensate for this issue. Now, if the EGR system quit working, the only thing you would notice is your engine run way better, you get more power, and your fuel economy would go up. If the EGR system quit working, the only thing you would notice is that the engine runs better, fuel economy would go up, and you'd have more power. OK, what's the downside? The downside is when you took your car in to get a smog, it wouldn't pass smog. It would pass HC and CO, bitching. But it would have a big old failure on oxides and nitrogen. And this was the era when we started taking our cars in to get them smogged, and they ran great. And everybody was happy, good fuel economy, good drivability, good power, but you'd still get an emissions failure because your oxides and nitrogen emissions would be too high. Joel, you feel me? Joel, I'm so glad you're here. I wish more professional mechanics would sit down and actually go to school and learn this stuff. Now, why did we have EGR failures? Well, because you have to realize that the smoke coming out of the engine is filled with carbon, soot, basically. And the little passageways that go to the EGR valve would get clogged. And when they get clogged, when the EGR valve opens, it's not going to have a whole bunch of smoke traveling. So what we would have to do, especially in the early engines, it was terrible. We'd have to get in there with a freaking steel coat hanger and get all the freaking carbon. After all, diamond is carbon. You know, just like the carbon buildup on the back of the intake valves on a direct injected engine, like that. And we'd have to get in there with a steel uh, uh, um, coat hanger and break up all that carbon, get all the carbon out of the exhaust passages. And the early engines were not designed to make that easy, just so the EGR system would work. So now we've got your car so it passes smog, but now it runs terrible and it gets worse gas mileage and it gets worse power. Can you see why people might be kind of not happy with the EGR system? Because yeah. they weren't. Now, we started getting electronic EGR valves, right? Because we started getting we started getting good with electronics. So now we've got the fuel controlled well, we've got the spark controlled well. 
And what happened was we started electronically controlling the EGR valve for one thing. Then we started having electronic EGR valves for another thing. I think we looked on the Suburban, it's actually got a stepper motor controlling the EGR flow. And what happened was we started getting rid of all these vacuum operated systems and we started controlling everything electronically. That in combination with precise fuel control, that in combination with fuel mapping and ignition mapping, and we ended up solving most of our problems with high emissions. Then we started having better engine designs. Remember, the new Toyota has, what, 40% efficiency? We were looking at like 8%, maybe 11% on the old engines. Now we're looking at 40%. How? Because we started getting our fuel control, we started getting our ignitions right, and we started having engine designs that would give us high efficiency, which is to say we would burn more of the fuel that comes in and we wouldn't have all these problems with engine design where we had little pockets inside the combustion chamber where nothing would burn. Now, what do we got? We got direct injection. You wanna call that number 10? We could. And you say, well, is that just an emission control system? No, but the effect it has on emissions is crazy because what happens now is we can run stratified charge. So that's gonna get crazy amounts of HC and CO. Because now we can have the direct injector shoot the gas, a rich mixture straight at a small but rich mixture straight at the spark plug. So it's going to fire even though it's insanely rich. And we've got an air fuel sensor rather than an oxygen sensor. We got a wide band instead of a narrow band, a regular oxygen sensor. As a result, we can control the air fuel ratio, not just between like 12 to one to 17 to one, but now we can go down to like eight to one to 22 to one. As a result, we can run these super lean mixtures. And not only can we run super lean mixtures, but we can do it successfully. So now we're not going to have big drivability problems. So what we see now is since we're so much better at running the engine, we don't have to have such restrictive, violent emission control systems. So what do we have now? Well, we're gonna have catalytic converters. Now we got a we got a oxygen sensor behind the catalytic converter there to make sure that we're monitoring how efficiently the catalytic converter is gonna go. Uh, most cars we don't have EGR systems. Because what we're doing now is we're designing engines, you know, we're using computer simulation to run all these engines. So we know exactly what's going on combustion wise, and we can design these engines so that we don't have to have a whole bunch of really restrictive um, emission control systems to still get the kind of numbers we want. Um, can you re remind me what, uh, oh, never mind. I'll look it up. What? I just, I couldn't remember what a stratified charge was. Um, okay, stratified charge. Stratified charge means that Say for instance, we've got port fuel injectors and direct injection. Stratified charge means what we're gonna do is we're gonna send in from the port fuel injectors a very lean mixture that a spark plug could never fire, way too lean. Remember the book and the lighter? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, okay. we're, gonna send, we're gonna send in a mixture that's so lean that a spark plug would never fire it. But then we're gonna have the direct injector shoot a charge right at the spark plug that's pretty rich, but it's very small. And that's going to create a big old explosion. Well, not a big explosion, but it's going to create a, an explosion, right? Because I can light this with a blowtorch. I just can't light it with a lighter. Right. And stratified charge means that I'm going to have the, the majority of the charge is going to be extraordinarily lean. I'm going to have a little bit of it, though, that's going to be rich enough, and I'm going to shoot it directly at the spark plug, that, that it's going to create an explosion that's going to be enough to blow up the whole big mixture. So it's like a shortcut kind of in a way. Yeah, it is. It is. And what it does is it takes a very 
it takes a small rich mixture and it lights off a much bigger lean mixture so that things like super crews, we're looking at effective um, air fuel ratios of like 22 to one, insanely lean. Now, are you gonna get good power off of that? No, and as soon as you step on the gas, it's gonna go away, but super crews. Yeah, 22 to one, I mean, you get insane gas mileage and you get insane, insanely great emissions as a result. So they've come a long way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's why, I mean, modern cars are a billion times better than these old clunkers, a yeah. billion times better on their worst day. Now I'm going up to Oakland, so I'm gonna see what kind of mileage I get just driving on the freeway with the Z06. Did I mention that the top speed on the Z06 is like 206? Not with me in it, but it is. Um, right, Rudy? 206, buddy, what up? So anyways, not with me in it though, but I've, I've never taken a long trip with it, but I'm going to. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to talk about a whole bunch of other systems, modern systems. So let's talk about a whole bunch of other modern systems. Number 10. Number 11. Now, these aren't strictly emission control systems. I think I'm done with emission control. Chuck, did I miss any emission control systems? Or Rudy, did I miss any? I don't think no. so. I don't believe so. I mean, we retarded the timing when we made the mixture really lean, and that caused a whole bunch of drivability issues. So let's talk about number 11, which would be cylinder delete. Okay, what's cylinder delete? Well, the idea is, and this came out on uh, the Turn off cylinders at certain times yeah. to conserve fuel economy. Came out on the C7 Corvettes called cylinder delete. The idea is, and we tried this back in the 70s and it was terrible, but we're much more sophisticated in you know the 2010s. Came out on the C7 Corvettes. Cylinder delete works like this. You don't always need eight cylinders. And when you want eight cylinders, you want them all to work. But the simple fact of the matter is if you're driving down the freeway at 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour on a level road, it only takes like 25 horsepower to run that vehicle. You don't need eight cylinders. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna shut off half of the cylinders. So basically you're running on a four cylinder. Now that's gonna make your fuel economy go way up. It's gonna make your emissions go way down but they better do a good job of doing cylinder delete because if they don't, what happened in the 70s is these things would just buck like crazy. It was called the 468 General Motors way, way back in the 70s. Back, remember when GM made a diesel engine out of a gasoline engine in the Oldsmobile and it just freaking sucked? Yeah, well, they were doing all these experiments and they did the 468 back in the mid 70s and it just sucked. The key to doing successful cylinder delete is that it has to be effectively unnoticeable, invisible. I mean, as far as the customer experience goes, you can't be noticing it going from four cylinders to six cylinders to eight cylinders and back. It has to be smooth as silk. And as we get more and more That's sophisticated- like BMW and Mercedes with their engine off at stops. The vehicle yeah. comes to a stop, it shuts the engine down. Let's, let's do that next. So cylinder leak is a big deal. You can see how it's really gonna increase your uh, fuel economy and increase your emissions performance. <clears throat> Number 12. Bring the page down a little. Like that? No, uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> All right. Number 12. Let's go ahead and talk about Automatic start stop. Uh, very, very common in modern automobiles. I suspect though, that you're gonna have significant starter issues because the starter's gotta be running all the time. And isn't all the engine wear when from starting and stopping it? That's the problem, see? Because 95% of your engine wear comes from starting and stopping. Why? 
because you're not going to have oil pressure. And if you don't have oil pressure, then the crankshaft journal is going to be laying on the bearing. And when you first start it, it's going to be rotating on the bearing itself. So I would suspect that there's going to be significant problems with engine wear in the vehicles with automatic start stop. What does that mean? That means when you come to a stop, the engine shuts off. When you step on the gas pedal again, the engine starts again. Starter issues, yeah, but I think there's gonna be crankshaft issues as well. What they did, this is when we started using really, really thin oil. Why? Because as soon as that engine starts to turn, we want pressurized oil all over <coughs> in every, where, where every bearing and journal is. So we started using really thin oil and, and it really represented a, a, a 180 in the, the manufacturer's philosophy. They used to say, let's use thick oil because it's got more weight carrying power, load carrying ability. Now they've swapped and they've said, no, let's get thin oil because that's gonna get everywhere as quickly as possible. So that's automatic start stop. Uh, and we have they also switched all of them over to full synthetic too. Right, yeah, sure, yeah, of course. Yeah. They better. What can you I mean on something on that, Mr. Rocliffe? Please. Uh, on those automatic start stop, I believe they're going to require a special battery also to support that. Sure. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Now, here in Southern California, we have no problems and we don't understand the importance of batteries and starters. But you go back east or someplace where it's cold and batteries and starters becomes a big, big problem, a bit, a significant issue. You know, you can't have stuff that's marginal when it's really cold because battery performance goes way down. Battery efficiency goes way down when it's cold. Plus, plus back there, you know, look what, what happens to oil in cold temperatures? It turns into grease, right? It starts to solidify. Now, even if you got the engine running, you wouldn't have oil pumping through the system. So it starts having a whole bunch of significant issues. <coughs> now. What year did the automatic start stop <coughs> start? Let's ask Rudy. Start stop, when? Um, 2009, I think, was the first year of it. That late? OK. Wow. That late, huh? OK. All right. What's number 13? Make more money. Hi, Bruce. Well, it is currently 7.30, folks, so let's go ahead and take a 15. This is a good place to stop because hybrid's going to take a while to explain. So let us go here. Let us go to pause recording. And I'll see you in 15 minutes, yeah? Talk about all right, so I want to talk about hybrid cars. What, what does hybrid mean? Hybrid means that we have batteries. And hybrid also means that we have a gasoline engine. And we can run off of either gas or electric propulsion. The car that made this popular Yes. Is the Prius. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Now, Prius has got some problems because let's start thinking about some stuff. If you got big old fat tires, you are not going to get good gas mileage, period. As you would know if you'd ever pushed a car with fat tires, it's a lot harder to push a car with fat tires than thin tires. Now, the Prius has really thin tires. Why? because that's going to enable us to have less rolling resistance, which is going to give us better fuel economy, lower emissions, all these good things. Well, these are all good things until you need the traction that bigger tires provide, and then you're in big trouble. So what we're starting to see now is when we get gains in one area, we start to lose in other areas. Now, how does the hybrid reduce emissions? Well, it primarily reduces emissions by... Using less gas. Using less gas because it's got a smaller motor. And we're going to use electric propulsion, which 
is arguably more efficient once you've generated the power. <clears throat> and thirdly, regenerative braking, which is to say we start getting the power that we've put, we, we start getting the energy that we've put into this moving vehicle back out of it instead of just wasting it with uh, friction and the brakes. So when we increase the efficiency of a vehicle, we're going to reduce the emissions of the vehicle. Problem is there are big trade-offs need to be considered. For instance, the Prius has some significant issues when it comes to, that's interesting. You don't see many Priuses anymore. Why is that? Why is that Rudy? You used to Tesla. see five years ago, we used to see Priuses all the time. Now we don't see Priuses hardly at all. Why? The battery. How, how the hell did you know that? I read a lot. It's expensive. <laughs> Michelle Norman, what's up? What's up to Michelle Norman? What's up? That's freaking superb, right? Because <laughs> what happens is how long do batteries last? Five to seven years. Okay, well, how much does a battery pack on a freaking Prius? $5,000. It's about three or $4,000 installed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the thing is, you know, it's like over half the value of the car. Man. Anyways, I had an argument in Culver City with any anyway, I'm not going to tell you about it, but it was about a Prius. My point <laughs> was that we start to better understand the trade-offs that, you know, lower emissions and um, 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 better fuel economy are going to cost us. And we've seen that it has a lot to do with engine complexity and system complexity. And now we got computers running a whole bunch of stuff. But the problem is these vehicles are keep getting more and more expensive. As we expect higher performance, we have to expect that these vehicles are going to be more expensive. Now, you look at the Tesla. Tesla is a rich man's car. Really, if you think about it, poor people can't afford these things. So less than a truck, man. Some yeah. Teslas, like in the Model Three, is less. It's like Tesla. the Model Three is now into the affordability of most people's car purchase price. How much? Like thirty-five, forty thousand. You think most people can afford a forty-thousand-dollar vehicle? Well, it's a new one for, for this I can't. price. I can't either. Right. I don't know what is what. Okay. Now, okay, so. What do, we, what do we need to know about the hybrids? Well, they're dangerous to work on. I know that much. Yeah. But it's a pretty established technology. It's nothing really fancy. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to be switching over between the gas and the electric. That's fine. But let's go to number 14, electric vehicles. Now, most people are more concerned about fuel economy. But there is an emissions Point. And since we're basically talking about advanced modern technology, let's go. Let's keep going. What's the biggest issue with electric vehicles right now? Well, charging stations. Yep. You're right. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's range. Yeah. Yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah. Two blocks and that's it. Well, the thing is, I mean, most of your electric vehicles do not have a long range. So if you've got a long way to drive or if you get stuck on the freeway, now you got to find a charging station. Good luck with that. So, I mean, your, your basic point is your basic premise is correct. Yeah, it's not good for road trips. Go to Vegas. Yeah, because they last like 320, 350 maximum, I think miles. Yeah, for now. But the problem is if we're trying to go across country, for instance. Yeah. Uh, are we going to sit there and charge the car for six hours, eight hours, whatever? No. Now, the thing is, you can fast charge these things, and that's what they're doing now with the modern stuff is they're fast charging stuff. But fast charging is going to beat the hell out of the battery, which means the battery's not going to last as long. And they're now, expensive. Most of these people are rich, so they don't care, but I just got to take a picture so freaking Texan knows what I'm doing right now. So range is the big issue. Now, like I said, we're talking about trade-offs now, which is useful because it's good to have an understanding of 
really fundamental issues in electricity and, me and, me and mecha mechanics. If we want to fast charge these batteries, it's going to beat up the batteries and wear them out faster because after all, you know, fast charging means more current, more current means more heat, more heat means more damage to the batteries. So as a result, this issue is a significant issue. The other issue is an issue that we in Southern California don't have, which is to say battery efficiency when weather is cold. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about that. How, how does these cars last in, say, cold weather and snow? Mm -mm. No, battery efficiency comes down to like 10, 20%. So you're screwed. Re really. And, and, you know, it's okay for us to have all kinds of pipe dreams. I mean, you realize that all these windmills are freaking bird slaughterhouses. You know, they're killing all kinds of bald eagles and all kinds of endangered species. But the hippies are like, no, we got to have windmills, right? Now, here's the thing. If we have big solar farms, like they built out in the desert, yeah. now all of a sudden people are like, oh, well, yeah, but the endangered tortoise uh, w w used to mate where you put the solar panel. And it's like, okay, great. Now... We've got to take the energy, for the electricity from where it's generated, which is the desert. I mean, there's all that sunlight. It's really, really hot. We got to take the energy from where it's generated to where we can use it. And now people are up in arms about, you know how people are. People are up in arms. They tried to do this in uh, Chino Hills. They tried to put up transmission towers. People are like, oh, no, the view. Well, you can't have both. You can't have abundant electricity without transmission towers. Now, can you bury it underground? But that, that's insanely expensive to bury it underground. Plus, if it ever needs to be serviced, that's insanely expensive. Plus, where are you going to get the right away? So, I mean, we're talking about these trade-offs that people don't understand. So when they start talking about all these new technologies, they start talking pretty stupid stuff. Because, you know, if you don't have a fundamental understanding, a fundamental grounding in technology, you can't really have an intelligent conversation about this stuff anymore. Really? Aren't they, aren't they making like some kind of fuel out of coffee grounds or something? Or some kind of car parts out of coffee grounds? Or, yeah, they are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to um, find the article that I read. Okay. Yeah, they are They're making some kind of part out of recycled coffee grounds. Now, to me, the biggest issue with electric vehicles is where are you going to get the electricity from? Yeah, because uh, we can't even generate enough power. I mean, we're getting brownouts during the summer. Texas is getting brownouts during the summer. We can't generate enough electricity as it is. And now all of a sudden we're supposed to power, you know, 200 million electric cars as well. Yeah, not going to happen. Plus, plus, this is the worst part. <laughs> you look at these electric vehicles, they're hooked up to a coal fired power plant somewhere. Yeah, almost all of them. Now, the transmission of electricity 400 miles, it's just the coal fired power plant is not in California. It's in Arizona. It's on the Indian reservations where the federal uh, um, EPA guidelines don't apply. So now we're just destroying the Indian reservations with all this pollution. But people don't care because like I said, they watch too much TV news and that's what they think is real. So they don't why think they don't about do, it. Why they don't do like uh, many nuclear stations? Like in friends. Oh God, no, no. <laughs> Can kill us? People actually think that nuclear power plants can explode. They actually think that. Because they're so dumb. Well, unless it's in the Chernobyl and you know, nobody take the way it was taken care of there, but the way it's in France, because I know like ninety five percent of France is running on nuclear energy. Right. That's because they have a better class of hippies than we have. <laughs> um yeah. But you think uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars won't <laughs> work well? I know, I know it's more explosive, but also regular cars used to explode before. Yeah, but hi, not like hydrogen. Hydrogen is one of the most explosive things. I mean, back when I was at Cal State LA during the 80s, they were going to put a hydrogen fueling station up there, but they realized that it, if, it ever lift, lifted, if it ever lit off, it would blow the whole university off that mountain, which is true because hydrogen is insanely explosive, really, really explosive. Now, here's the thing I was going to say <clears throat> about nuclear power. We had San Onofre, we had nuclear power plants and they were kicking ass. And the hippies just said, oh, nuclear, mm, meh, 
right? It's like, it doesn't make any sense. People, people want the electricity, but they don't want the things that make the electricity. Our infrastructure was built for 20 million people in California. Now yeah. we got 40 million people. And if you try to build a dam, oh no, you can't do it. So yeah. as a result, you can't build anything in California anymore. It's freaking dumb. And then people are wondering, uh, why can't, why are all these people homeless? Well, because you've got the property value so high because you can't build anything. The property values are so high that normal people can't afford to live in a place. It's not like before where you could like, oh, for cheap, you could live someplace. Another problem right now, they don't build much new development. No, you know, lumber is, lumber is really high right now. Lumber is insanely high, isn't it? No, it's, it's very it's, high. They're supposed to be 3D printing homes in no, but, uh, materials. but materials, yeah. So, yeah, also uh, metal is uh, expensive, yeah, right yeah. now. So, everything seems to be falling apart now. Everything um, seems to be falling apart. I'll tell you, every past called recession. <laughs> Every pastor I know, without exception, and I know a couple of them, every pastor I know is planning on going to jail. They are, they've, they've already set them, their, their, their affairs in order. They're planning on going to jail because they're convinced they're going to. I mean, this is, it's a weird time. It's a weird time. Yeah, let's, right. let's do this. Now, you have to understand that there's resistance in every wire, even transmission wires, power transmission wires, right? Because the Hoover Dam's like 400 miles away. We lose 30% of the electricity that we get from Hoover Dam just transmitting it over here. 30%, that's huge. Yeah. People don't understand that. They're, that's why they want, they want all this electricity generated someplace else so they don't have to see it in their neighborhood, right? NIMBY, not in my backyard. But they want to have the use of the electricity here. It's not feasible, really. It really isn't. You know, And you have to understand that one ship going down the coast of California puts out more uh, pollution than uh, every car in California combined. How? Because it's not regulated in terms of emissions. Like locomotives, I don't, I don't know if they're regulated now, but they weren't. So that's the thing about emission controls. It's, it's, you have to look at the whole big picture. Okay, so where are we at? Well, let's go here. Number 15. <coughs> I want to say multi-speed transmissions, but that's wrong. Let's say eight, nine, 10 speed transmissions. Like the C8 Corvette has a eight speed, right? What do they call them, dual clutch? Rudy, who uses a dual clutch transmission? Everybody, right? Audi, Lamborghini, uh, Ferrari, mm -hmm. um, most of your semis are running dual clutch trans yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one other one. Well, there's a bunch of them, Rudy. Because oh, yeah. Volkswagen is starting to use it in there. Higher end cars. There's a bunch of them. Now, here's the thing about that. Why do we have all these speeds for the transmission? Because we want to have the engine operating in a very narrow range. Because remember, the camshaft is going to provide the personality of the engine. Well, that's going to provide, you know, you have to look at the horsepower. The horsepower is going to be very peaky like that. It's going to have a point where it's high. You know, this is RPM here. And this is hp here it's going to be very peaky depending on how they grind the camshaft it's going to be very peaky so what they want to do is the same thing they did on uh, motorcycles you know a motorcycle engine like especially the old ones only has power in a very narrow rpm band so what they did with the speeds is they wanted to keep it in that rpm band and that's what we're doing now with the eight nine ten speed transmissions now i, I got to tell you this is a very complex transmission I don't know about people's ability to rebuild these things, but this is a very complex transmission. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to keep the RPM in a very narrow band here where the engine efficiency is at the maximum. But that's gonna, I mean, this is an expensive transmission. 
I can imagine how much it would cost to rebuild it. But what did we see, for instance, in the 70s? We had the Turbo 400, and then all of a sudden it turned into the 4L60. No, 700 R4. Then it turned into the 4L60 when we made it electric. What was the 700 R4? It was just the Turbo 400 with an overdrive. So I guess we could say number 16 would be overdrive transmissions. What does overdrive mean? It means that the output shaft is turning slower, turning faster than the input shaft, faster. So it'd be like 0.8 to one. That's the six gear in, no, it's not. Let's see, fifth gear in the six speed I've got, fifth gear is like 0.82 to one. And sixth gear is like 0.64 to one or something like that. Your paper up. Ah, there you go. These are both overdrive gears, fifth and sixth. Now, what does that mean? That means the engine, I mean, when I'm going down the freeway at like 65 miles an hour, I'm probably turning 1500 RPM. That's crazy. Well, what it does is it gives you really insane gas mileage and it also gives you much decreased emissions because we're running the engine at a lower speed using less fuel. And like Michelle says, if you use less fuel, you're going to get less emissions automatically. So the good thing about this little project that we're doing right now is that it's allowing us to talk about all the newest technology because the newest technology is designed to give us what the five things we said were the reason for everything the manufacturers do. Lower emissions, better fuel economy, more power, better drivability, less engine wear. It's the reason they do everything. Now, overdrive transmissions, we've been doing overdrive transmissions for a long time since the, like I said, the mid 70s. We're getting a lot better at it. <laughs> you know, electronic control in itself is gonna make things better, more efficient. Is that the last page? That is the last page. Two sides. So that is 200 pages of notes in this class. We're working. We're working. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Questions, comments, thoughts on this so far? I have a comment. Uh, why don't they, in uh, with auto mechanics, why don't they have like some kind of continuing education that they're required to get? Because with all this stuff coming out, you have to stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, how come they don't require that like they do with nurses and stuff? Required, it's recommended. Because nursing is a profession. Well, I think I mean, this is too. Nursing requires a license. Well, why doesn't auto mechanics? Because then mechanics would take over the world. No. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, yeah. you go to someone and they're totally incompetent and they're, there's no way to tell. Right. Well, the problem is that, you know, people working in their driveway can often get a bunch of stuff fixed. Right. As a result, you know, now, why are, why are nurses licensed? Why are teachers licensed? So you can take away the license for malfeasance, right? Well, with well also auto, to prove competence. Yeah, with auto repair, you know, we, we're still in, we're still, we still have this notion that someone with no training, like for instance, or self-trained, I mean, if, if you're highly motivated, you can go really far. You can, but you know, as we see these more complex systems, we see, wow, this is this is stuff that if you don't go to school, there's no freaking way you're going to understand it. You can't learn this by doing it. You can't. Right. And it's it seems like it comes out so fast that there's no way, unless you're taking some kind of classes, you're not going to stay on top of it. Right. And that's exactly true. And that's what most people find is you got to be, we got to be doing, that's why we have diagnostic, diag.net, right? Right. Joel, you should be on diag.net. I wonder, can you guys get school or student memberships? Are you on diag.net? Diag yeah, okay. I just signed up and then they approved me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said I was one of your students. That's it. Really? And they yeah. still? And they still <laughs> yeah. 
Let me show you something that I thought was good. I put it, I posted it on diag.net because I thought it was so good. Go over here. Diagnostic network right there. Okay, so let's go here. Um, let's see, as you can see, it's got a bunch of useful stuff. What is this a picture of? Where is it? Start system, start, stop start system starter current. That's interesting. Thought you might like, this is what I did. Ah, oh, God damn it, really? Oh, good. Good, I'll do this for my good friend Chuck because he's my pally pal now. Chuck, you'll like it. Yep, there you go, right there. Like that? Hmm. Yeah, that's good. Let me take a picture of that. Right? <laughs> yeah, I like that. I mean, that's that's true of electricians too, right? Yes. Because they see how fast you do the job and they're like, why am I paying you so much? You know? Yeah. Anything like that. Because I, I didn't get blood all over your carpet. You know? Right? I didn't kill your grandma. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah, you know. <laughs> all right. Let me show you something. Let's go back while we're here. Come up here to stop start. Stop start starter system current. Um, battery voltage drops below six volts on initial crank. Wow. Then you see the amperage as, as the windings turn. Wow, is that voltage? New battery. Yeah, new battery, right? AGM, AGM battery. What's an AGM battery? Rudy, what's an AGM battery? Wow, look at this. That's interesting. Uh, is that a gel or the winding? I can't remember. Yeah. Dmitry Levchenkov. Sounds like a good country boy. Um, wow, 600 amps. Well, under six volts as the voltage goes down and current's gonna go up, but 600 amps starter draw? That's crazy. Wow. 1500 amps. Oh, inrush, inrush cranking current was 1500 amps, right? Because motors pull a whole bunch more current before they settle down. Like way up here. Crazy. That's cool. But you can see that modern technicians, look, Michelle's exactly correct. If you ain't, if you, if you can't do this, you know, stick with the brake jobs. You know, you can, you can replace spark plugs or air filters. That's cool. But this is what the real ones are doing. And I think what we're going to see, Ms. Norman, I think what we're going to see is a professionalization of this field. But professionalization means that you have to go to school and you have to get licensed. Now, I believe in Europe, you have to be licensed to be a mechanic. Certain places, I don't know. I don't know. But this kind of stuff, you ain't going to learn this on the job unless you're highly, unless you're Chuck Reyna, of course. You ain't going to learn stuff like this on the job. Most people are not that concerned about continuing education. They don't really care how good of a job they do as long as they can feed their families. Well, that's why you have different levels, right? Right. Like, like in, in nursing, you have like a CNA, then an LVN, then an RN. Right. It's how far you want to take it. Right. And, that, and that's the point of certification, the ASC certification for technicians. Yeah. Because what they're going to do in the, in the higher levels is they're going to start showing you graphs like this and ask you what the hell that means. Is this a good fuel injector uh, uh, um, waveform, for instance? Now, you can go to Nate Davis or Scanner Danner, and they'll show you, they'll do a big old analysis of waveforms. So you can learn this stuff. All these resources are available. The question is, are you going to make use of them? And that's what I told you know the students, the high school students. I said, look, you're going to be the first generation that had all of these resources available to you. And it's going to be very clear, very obvious who the freaking lazies are and who the people are that are really go-getters, productive. Because, you know, if you, can't, if you can't do this, you can't do this kind of job. And if you can't do this job, all you can do is guess. 
well, maybe it needs a new battery. I don't know, maybe it needs a new starter, right? So now you're just throwing parts at it. And that's why we're not a profession because we got so many people that just really don't know what the hell they're doing. And, and these scary. cars, as we can see, yeah, it's terrifying. And the worst part about it is they're just beating up customers because these customers are like, well, uh, okay, I took my car in and he charged me $1,500 and it's still not fixed. Well, if you took it to Scott Brown and get fixed the first time, guaranteed. Lo barato sale caro, right? You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. What you think is cheap turns out to be expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. why if you have any kind of tricky diagnostic issue like that, you're better off taking it to Scott Brown. You know, just cut out the middleman because if you're probably going to have to get it towed there anyway after this jackass has spent $1,500 because he didn't know what he was doing, you're probably going to have to tow it out of his shop and take it to Scott Brown anyway. So you might as well cut out the middleman and just go there first. Makes sense. Yeah. But this is what the industry is looking like. And this, incidentally, this is how, you know, technicians are making over 100 grand a year. But you got to be able to do this. Now, to answer your question, we don't have certification. Well, we got voluntary certification, but we don't have, you know, legal licensing certification. But if you want to go to the next tier in terms of earning, this is what you got to be able to do. If you want to be a diagnostic technician or a master technician, let me show you what the pyramid looks like. Huh, let's start a new one. This was a model originally um, floated by Mercedes. So let me get back where we were here. New share, come here like this, go here. It goes like this. We've got a master technician up here, does all the diagnostics. We've got a journeyman here, which is an experienced qualified mechanic, but they're actually going to be responsible for doing the work. But you don't need a master technician to do all this stuff. A master technician is going to lead like a team leader. Here's another journeyman here. And then you're going to have an apprentice down here. Because after all, you don't want someone who's making 30 bucks an hour taking tires on and off. It doesn't make sense. And you sure as hell don't want someone making 60 or 70 bucks an hour taking tires off. So this person is going to be doing most of the diagnostics. They're going to tell the, give the findings to the journeyman, but this apprentice is going to do basically parts washing and stuff like, you know, uh, pulling the car in and out, all the stuff that you don't want your super qualified people to do. And this is how we end up with a, a five person team that's incredibly efficient because this person is going to be spending all their time, you know, training, right? One week out of every month, probably. Yeah. Going it's just back. Just like medical, I swear. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it has to be. It trips me out. Yeah. It has to be. Yep. So. That's where the industry is and that's where the industry is headed. And the simple fact of the matter is you choose your place here. You choose which you choose who you're going to be. If right. you want to get drunk all weekend, you're probably going to stay here. If you go to I don't know, a two year community college program, you're probably going to be here. If you're ready to be constantly learning, if you're going to watch every new scanner Danner video, if you're going to invest in new equipment, See, this person buys hand tools. This person buys diagnostic tools. Probably never touch a wrench. Probably almost guaranteed will never touch an impact. Now, this system is not currently in place in heavy truck that I'm aware of. Why? Because there's, there's not enough of these. See, heavy truck is where um, vehicle, uh, cars were, you know, like 20, 30 years ago. Now we're starting to get very electrified and people are just completely lost. Yeah, now yeah. there's there's an attitude in commercial vehicles that says, don't waste time on diagnostics, let's just replace everything. 
but I can't see that attitude lasting much longer. I think that's dependent on the fact that there's just not that many people who can do good diagnostics. But when you're working with commercial vehicles, you're working with a vehicle that the customer is losing money every hour that vehicle isn't running. Yeah. yeah. So as a result, these people are in a big hurry and they don't want you to misdiagnose something and then have to bring the vehicle back. That would, that's a freaking nightmare. Get stuck somewhere with the same yeah. problem. So they're willing to pay top dollar, which is, you know, which is why I did what I did because commercial vehicles, they pay awesome, but you got to be on point. Yeah. So there's a ton of opportunity in heavy duty right now because there's, there's hardly anybody that does this. They're still free, basically they're hillbillies compared to what we have in automotive. They're freaking hillbillies. They're like, ha, 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 you know, it's like, and you know, there's, there's a bunch of people with skills, but you know, I, I myself was talking to a professional who ran generators for a very, very large uh, HD company, which I shall not name, but he ran generators all the time and he'd been running generators for 15, 20 years, but he didn't know a goddamn thing about electricity. He didn't. Gabe, he, he didn't know a damn thing about electricity. Like he didn't even understand, you know, the three wires coming down to your house. And this is someone who worked on generators for 15 years. How? Because it's all in the manual, right? You because just, all he did was work on the motor side, not the generation no, side of it. He ran the generators. He ran the generators. But the thing is, the, the factory puts out a book that says, if you get this reading, put the setting here. He didn't understand it. Right. He didn't understand. They don't get it. the logic behind it. Yeah, he didn't understand inductors and capacitors. I can't, do, I can't learn stuff like without knowing the rationale. I yeah, can't. which which sets you apart from most people because most people are very happy to put in the minimum amount of effort possible. And as a result, choose your rate, choose your fate, right? You know, if you want to stay a private forever, you can. If you want to be a sergeant, you know, that's cool. But if you want to go up and be an officer, you're going to have to kick it up a notch. You know, what do they call it? Green to gold in the army. So this is basically the blueprint of your life. Choose who you want to be and then make it happen. Go for it. Exactly. So. Um, it's true. You know, and especially here, you know, in America, you can actually be whoever you want. If right. you cannot do, do, make it here, you cannot make it in any other country. Right. Right. No, this is true. And, you know, some people are happy being clerks. Some people oh, are. Yeah. You know, well, we need them. We need yeah. clerks. Right. Well, not for long, though. I saw an article um, just yesterday about how most of these white collar jobs, like data analysis, are being, are being uh, replaced by robots. So That's these scary. jobs, yeah, these jobs that no, it's it's actually, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, most of the factories have been, most of the factory jobs have been replaced by robots, so, and you know, automation is a better way to say. Well, do you think auto mechanics are going to be someday? Uh, a great a great deal of it. Yeah. Yeah. As we get better at diagnostics, there will be less and less of that work for mechanics to do. Right. In fact, okay, look. If I take an x-ray of somebody, why can't I just send that x-ray to India, for instance? You can. And have a radiologist in India analyze it. You can. Yeah, well, that's, what, that's where the future's going. You know, that's where the future's going. So what we have to do if we want to have a career, you know, I'm at the end of the career. I, I don't really have to worry about it too much. But you younger people will figure out what's, what's it going to look like. Because now in terms of structural design, people designing buildings and stuff, a lot of America has been hollowed out for stuff like that. And there's a whole bunch of jobs that they required a bachelor's degree, but they didn't really care what your bachelor's degree was in, like insurance underwriting or stuff like that. That's I'm, I'm not going to give that as a, per, at a, as a perfect example, but stuff like that, loss, uh, loss per, you know, stuff like that, stuff that you could just get a bachelor's degree in history or whatever, and the bachelor's degree itself served as a qualification. Well, a bunch of these low-level jobs are just being um, done by, uh, they're, they're getting replaced by automation. 
you know, they found out that uh, uh, computers were way better at um, doing like x-ray analysis than real doctors are. Yeah. You know, they're much better at, at processing a whole bunch of information and turning it into a diagnosis. Yeah, especially when you have also artificial intelligence to help you today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So can you, can you, uh, can an auto mechanic be replaced by that? Well, certain aspects of it, Some of but, yeah. certain aspects of it, but you know, how long is that going to be? Yeah. And, and okay, I'm going to say this, can you replace an electrician with a robot or artificial intelligence? No, no. The Plumbers, nurses, no. Right. Yeah, right. there's some things you can't. Right. And those are the things we need to focus on, you know, but, but I think there's going to be a bloodbath in the lower levels, you know, people that are like clerks and stuff like that. I think there's going to be a bloodbath and these people are going to be very, very sad. Did I tell you about this incidentally, which I think is sensational. Did I tell you about this, this book, how not to become a millennial, uh, learning from America's largest sociological disaster by Vince Barrick. This book is insanely great. And it's addressing all of these issues that I think uh, modern reality is 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 showing to be a big big problem. All right, so let's talk about the approach that they're using in diesel right now. And Chuck, you'll probably find this interesting. You know, they got a few. They got electronic fuel injectors now. Do you understand that in one in one combustion event, they're firing the injector like five times? Five different times. So they're getting the benefits of stratified charge, for instance, because they're they're firing the fuel injector when the when it's way down low in the cylinder, and then they're firing a different load when it's you know where the normal injector would fire. And then they're firing at the end of while the piston's going down on the power stroke. They're firing the injector again so that there's going to be enough fuel to keep the uh, the um, emission control system hot enough to function. It's crazy the stuff they're doing with diesel and firing the injector multiple times, like five times instead of once. It's amazing to see. It's amazing to see. But after all, you know, we're, we're just wor you're worried about all these emissions. Well, you know what? They just found out about diesel emissions. What? That it causes diabetes and other problems in your body. Yeah, just breathing one for one day, breathing in um, diesel emissions. Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah. Wow. You know what really causes diabetes is my car. It's so sweet. <laughs> is what? It's so sweet. My oh. <laughs> Uh, uh. <laughs> That's funny. Now, here's the thing about diesel. We'll, we'll talk about diesel. <coughs> DPF, you know what that stands for? What number is that? 15 or something? 17. 17? 17. Okay, 17. And we're going to talk about diesel primarily now. Uh, that would be the diesel particulate filter filter uses horse urine right actually so does the that's interesting that's interesting because this uses horse urine but so does uh the um insulin yeah that's, isn't that weird okay so mm -hmm. diesel particulate filter why because we got a lot of soot you know what soot is it's mm -hmm. like little chunks of carbon now this uses urea, which is urine, on to do what? To knock down the soot because diesel has insanely high compression, right? It has twice as much compression as a gasoline engine. So as a result, what we have to do is we have to have all kinds of NOx treatment, all kinds of NOx treatment, and we have to have this diesel particulate filter to deal with the soot. Now, people ask, you know, diesel engines are so much more efficient than gasoline engines. Why don't we have diesel engines for cars in America? And the real answer is they just have their emissions are out of control. Now, 
what about modern diesel trucks? Like for instance, the Cummins and the Ram that puts out a thousand foot pounds of torque. How are we getting acceptable emissions? Well, we got the DPF for one thing, but more importantly, we've got insanely precise fuel control. Great, great engine design. Now, Caterpillar is pretty much out of the on-highway market for engines now because they couldn't make the tier four uh, emissions requirements. So pretty much everything diesel on highway is Cummins now. So Cummins has got it going on. Incidentally, you know, you live about 10 miles away from a factory Cummins school. So are you taking advantage of that? Or are you sitting and watching TV, you know? That's the thing. I mean, 13 years, I'm going to be seven. Hey, watching you. Yeah, quack. 13 years, <laughs> I'm going to be, 13 years, I'm going to be 70. You know, uh, 57 is only middle-aged if you're going to be, if you're going to live to 114. God, I hope not. So I'm downhill. And, so I'm, doing, I'm downhill and hard. But if you want to be well-established when you get to be my age, you're going to have to be strumming it when you're, in your 20s and 30s hard to communicate to the kids because they're not listening to old people they're listening to each other yeah. and they don't know a damn thing about a damn thing they're listening to unsuccessful people so they're learning how to become unsuccessful all right what else came us oh 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 okay how about 18 Hi. Differential. Gear ratios. Hmm. Well, so that would so that'd be like two point seven three to one. Three oh eight to one, whatever. What happened was the differential adds gear reduction, which is torque multiplication. What we used to do is we used to put in, you know, 373s, something like that, which gave us low gears, which gave us a lot of torque multiplication. Unfortunately, it meant that when you're driving down the freeway, your engine would be running at a relatively high speed. So we started putting in gear ratios like this, 273s. We got out of the threes. If you want to have a drag car, it's not uncommon for a drag car to have like 456s. It goes up to like 513s. I mean, 411s is probably the most common from the old days. But it's not uncommon to have 456s in a smaller engine. Really gives you tons of torque because all that torque multiplication goes and multiplies whatever the output of your transmission is. So you could end up with you know 2,000 foot-pounds of torque at the tire. That's going to give you good acceleration. But what we did is we started going the opposite direction with our gear ratios. Why? Because that's going to make the engine run at a lower RPM as you go down the freeway. I think of the Z06 is like 308. It's not a low gear ratio. As a result, top speed on the Z06 is you know 204. Top speed, like, like top speed on just the regular C5 Corvettes, like 190 something, because it's got 273s. Now that's gonna jack up your acceleration. That's why most of these cars are gonna have, if they're successful, they're gonna have a very low first gear, very low first gear to give it the torque multiplication. So you got decent acceleration, but if you want something that's really going to accelerate, you got to get away from these and start going to 373s or you know 411s, stuff like that. Anyway, this is how they did it. And you start to see the trade-off. If you want the lower emissions, if you want the better fuel economy, you're going to pay for it with acceleration. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Really what we're trying to do is we're trying to lower the RPMs. If you lower the RPMs, chances are good you're gonna have less power. So what we, what we begin to understand is that we are, tra we are always constantly trading off 
it's very rare that we get something for nothing. So let's do this. Alternator, what down, we'll call it shutdown, whatever. The alternator is, the job of the alternator is to charge the battery. Okay, well, once the battery's charged, what does the alternator do? Well, on most cars, you know, well, I'm sorry, once the battery's charged, did I say that right? Once the battery's charged, what does the alternator do? Well, on most cars and the old cars, you know, we'd have a battery voltage of say 13.2 and the alternator would be putting out 13.8 or 13 point whatever. As a result, it would still be charging the battery even, the batter even though the battery was fully charged. Well, it takes energy to run the alternator and it takes energy to create that voltage. So what it was doing was it was robbing power from the crankshaft. And if you rob power from the crankshaft, your fuel economy is gonna go down, your emissions are gonna go up. So what we started doing is we started shutting down the alternator when the battery was charged. See, we're getting more sophisticated in our strategies. We're getting more advanced. And as a result, we start getting significantly better fuel economy. I mean, one to two miles per gallon, that's not insignificant. That's what, 5%? Maybe if it was two to three miles per gallon, that would be 10%. That's significant. So what we do is we shut down the alternator when the battery is already charged. Now, as we run the vehicle, the battery is going to discharge because we got to run the ignition system, we got to run the injectors, we got to run the computer and the radio and all sorts of stuff like that. So once the battery state of charge goes, battery voltage goes down to a certain point, then the computer is going to kick the alternator back on, charge the battery up. When the charge battery, when the battery gets fully charged, we're going to shut off the alternator again. As a result, we can see some significant savings in terms of fuel economy and some significant uh, increase in emissions performance. So basically what we did is we started off with a discussion of pure emission controls. And now we're in a discussion of advanced technology that's gonna lower emissions, but it's not really emission controls. It's other stuff we're doing that's going to make the emissions better. Okay, Max. That's 19. That's pretty good. Hmm. Under car shields. Now, we already talked about running thin tires so we get better efficiency and the trade-off of you know stability and uh, traction. Let's talk about this because this a lot of people don't understand this and I know my vast audience of YouTube uh, watchers. There's actually some dude from Nigeria that watches all my videos. Props to you, props to you man. Glad to have you. Um, I mean this kind of instruction is probably not even available. Who knows? But what I do know is Modern cars underneath are going to have these plastic shields, you know, that are like three feet by four feet or whatever, whatever size. What's the point of that? The point of that is so that the air that goes under the car doesn't get stuck going into the engine compartment and hitting the firewall and stuff like that, which causes all kinds of resistance. It's a wind resistance issue. Now, most people, they don't understand that. All they understand is that it makes it a pain to get to the oil filter, for instance, to change the oil. So what they do is they just leave the, fil they leave the shields off or they don't put them back on, period. Or they don't put them on correctly because you know they break fasteners because they don't really know what they're doing or they lose the fasteners because they're sloppy. As a result, what happens is we start getting drag underneath the vehicle and that's going to create a significant issue when it comes to emissions and fuel economy, such like that. Now, will people notice? Probably not, but people don't usually notice a bunch of stuff that they should. So 
If you have undercar shields, take care of them. If they're falling down, fix them. Now you can get all these fasteners on, you know, Amazon, eBay, whatever. It's not hard to do. Um, it's amazing how much of the stuff is available. Speaking of which, can you imagine how much CO2 is getting, getting pumped into the air by all these Amazon trucks uh, rolling all over the place? What? Why does nobody ever think of that? Well, because I guess that's my job. Because they're waiting on their package. <laughs> right. <clears throat> all right. Where else you at? Alignment. There's a lot, there's a lot of mileage and vehicle efficiency tied up in having proper alignment. Most people don't do proper alignment because after all, they keep running into the curbs or they've got some, there's been some wreck or it's just expensive and they don't want to pay a hundred bucks unless there's a good reason. Most people don't pay that much attention to cars. But I'll tell you, you know, think of a cowboy that doesn't pay much. No, they attention. break down on them. Then they pay a lot of attention to it. Yeah, I didn't but do it at all, so I was but that person. Right, but the attention they pay to it is very, very momentary. Right, it's like because basically technology scares these people, and the less they interact with it, the happier they are. This was, uh, this was really, really. Um, worked over in that book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Most people are terrified of technology. And as a result, they want to keep away from it as much as possible. And, and it scares them. So they, it's like a, it's like a dog. They're scared of dogs, right? Well, you know, a dog can provide a lot of useful service to you, but you know, every time they, every time they think of dogs, they think of getting bit. And every time they think of technology, it's just some overwhelming force that they don't understand that's running their life and in many ways ruining their lives. That's how people were with computers, remember, when they first came out? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Mr. Rookliff, yes, sir. I got one more subject, maybe number 21. You just talked about uh, coefficient drag, about those undercarriage yeah. parts. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't talk about body shape and lighter materials in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. which would aid in fuel economy. That's all. Thank you, sir. Modern design and materials. Okay. Well, on the Z06, the floorboard is made of carbon fiber. The two front fenders are made of carbon fiber. Kind of ridiculous, but you know, it saves like 150 bucks. I mean, 150 pounds. Yeah, definitely not 150 bucks. Uh, but it saves like 150 pounds. I think that's kind of a, you know, if you have a spare tire in the trunk, it probably makes up for it. Um, but we can see that we start to, well, for instance, if you look at the mid 90s Camaros, they started making the stuff out of fiberglass instead of steel. We can see that we're working on new materials, more advanced materials that are going to be stronger. They're going to be lighter. We're seeing, for instance, um, frames and bodies being made, structural structures being designed on computers rather than hand drawn by some jackass. As a result, we can use less metal, which is going to make the vehicle cheaper. And it's also going to make it lighter and it's going to make it so it protects it the passengers better in the case of a crash. Doesn't it break easier though? Like if you go from like steel to, to plastic, isn't it going to not last as long? True. Yeah, true. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, like the plastic fenders they put on everything. Yeah, stuff like that. You see on the G5. Well, one of the things that you need to understand about these the new the new car designs is they have these things called crush zones. And I found this out in my 2001 Nissan Frontier. What they're doing is they're making everything absorb the force of the crash, except the passenger compartment, right? They're, they're protecting the passengers. Yeah. The problem is it just freaking totals the rest of the car really, really quick. But that's what absorbs all the energy so that the passengers are safe. 
I mean, it's called crush zones. It's, it's a way they design the vehicles now. So when there's an impact, the parts of the car that don't have passengers in them are exactly. going to absorb all that load and it just freaking wrecks the car. That's one of the reasons why you don't see so many old cars because if they get in a wreck, they just get way wrecked. Well, you don't need to drive when you're dead, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. But they do, you know, they do protect the passengers. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that. I mean, I, I ran my Nissan Frontier, some freaking jackass pulled out in front of me in a Explorer, I think. Might have been a Suburban whatever they pulled out in front of me on arrow highway i was going about 50 40 miles an hour they pulled out right in front of me and it totaled the freaking frontier and i think it bent the running board on the suburban wow so really that's what you know chuck that's what we should talk about you know the price of gas has gone up what 70 cents since the 20th whatever but nobody talks about it yeah i do i complain about it all the time yeah but uh, i mean on the like news and stuff Oh, I know, huh? Right. Yeah. So uh, number 22 is going to be what vehicle selection. Now, what we've been talking about all day, a recurring theme is buy when everyone else is selling and sell when everyone else is buying. Correct. And this has never been so important as when it comes to cars. Because what happens every time the price of gas goes significantly up is people start selling the suburbans, excursions, big stuff. They start selling it because they say, oh, gas just went up a dollar fifty. Now I've got to get something that gets better mileage. So they sell their big stuff cheap because they're in a hurry to get rid of it. And anytime you're in a hurry to get rid of anything, you're going to lose money. So then they buy an economy vehicle. Okay, fine. But the problem with the economy vehicle is that it's small, it doesn't have much room, it's probably uncomfortable, and it's scary as hell when you're driving down the freeway when you're surrounded by big trucks and you've got this little tiny car. So what happens then is when the price of gas goes down, now they want to get back in that Suburban. They want to get back in the excursion because the simple fact of the matter is if you're driving the Suburban like my Suburban, that's wonderful for a family because you know, it can get hit like four cars at the same time and the family will be safe. It's got lots of room, can carry all kinds of stuff. So when the price of gas goes down, people are selling their gas saver cars really cheap because they want to get the big car that gives them protection, uh, a good Vista and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, a car that gets good mileage is probably going to be pretty low. So less wind resistance, like Chuck was talking about, less coefficient of drag. But many people like to drive where they're higher up so they can see more stuff. So you could probably do reasonably well just buying on that, which is to say when the price of gas goes up, buy big stuff. When the price of gas goes down, buy small stuff. And these people are dumb enough to where they can't do the math because after all, they went to school in America. That was a joke, but it wasn't really funny. Um, they, were, <laughs> they were taught by my colleagues um, from Cabo. <laughs> and, right um no they can't do the math so they don't understand that you know every time you change vehicles you're going to pay a premium for the thing you want because that's what everyone else wants at the same time plus you're going to have to pay for registration uh, uh doing the smog all kinds of stuff like this and and what you under what you begin to understand if you were to do a spreadsheet or a, or a even competent financial analysis for instance, let's say that the price of gas goes up $2. So now it's, what, $5 a gallon? Okay, it used to be $3 a gallon. Now it's $5 a gallon. I drive 10,000 miles a year. Okay, so I don't know. I Something tells me that Vadim's going to be way better at this than I, than I am. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> so I've got, I've got a vehicle that has 20 miles per gallon but I'm buying a vehicle that's got 30 miles per gallon and I drive 10,000 miles a year. How much money do I save if I get the car that gets 30 miles per gallon? So you do 10,000. Well, basically, I'll tell you right now. Thousand, about what? 5,000. Basically, you save a thousand, a, a, a thousand gallons because the difference is 10, uh, 10 miles a gallon. So you divide it 10,000 by 10. 
David Burks, do you mind if I ask you what you do all day for a job? I mean, uh, fix systems problems for the county. Oh, okay. Because I was wondering, you got that, you got the math pretty quick. So I was wondering. If oh, you... I'm an engineer by trade. There you go. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, welcome. <laughs> so, listen, Rockley, basically, if you pay $2 more, so it's going to be $2,000 more you're going to pay. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. When you buy that new Honda and you drive it off the lot, how much money did you just lose? Right. Away, well, the depreciation for first, first year, I know it's like 30% or something, right? Uh-huh. So you buy this car for $40,000, you've lost $12,000. But you know you can write off depreciation from the taxes. <laughs> you, can you, write have... off, you can write off depreciation. If you have a business, then you can- If you have it. a business, yeah, all right. If, okay, so let's say, let's say you don't have a business. So my point was, you're saving $3,000, but it's costing you $12,000 to save that $3,000. See, you can't be churn. That's called churn, right? No, totally, totally. You're totally it. right. Yeah. So, as a result, my theory is get something you like and stick with it and be more serious, be more deliberate in terms of what we're buying and why, you know? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, just, just, just the analysis that Vadim just did is way beyond most people. And as a result, what happens is they just make continuously stupid decisions about vehicles to buy. And then, you know, like people's court, they go buy a car for 3,600 and put a $4,500 engine in it. You know, stuff is dumb. Now it's all about the return on the investment. It is. And, and, and the thing is, I mean, we've seen me and Vadim have seen very clearly what happens when you don't pay attention to money. Totally. And, but you know, but luckily, your case is one of the biggest savings a month that I usually see. Right. So here I am. As, <laughs> yeah. Here I am as your cautionary tale. No, seriously, like in, it, it, it is pretty extreme. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, because I don't pay attention to stuff like that. I'm a, yeah, but now it's all. But now you do. I'm a lover, not a counter quack. <laughs> so anyways, my point was. Cause, you know sometimes i save people 200 dollars a month 300 but here it was like really good one <laughs> right. right on which i'm happy yeah, yeah. Yes, too. <laughs> it's new. damn it's, st it's stupid the money i've wasted i mean yeah, but... i don't pay attention to stuff like that i'm too busy and besides saving you also have extra money to spend right like all together yeah so my point was Vehicle selection makes a huge amount of difference. For instance, if I was to get an all-wheel drive vehicle, right, I get the Eddie Bauer edition. I don't understand that that means, do they still have Eddie Bauer edition? I don't think so. Okay, let, let's say I got an Eddie, Eddie yes. Bauer edition Explorer. That's all-wheel drive. Now, if I don't have a compelling reason to get all-wheel drive, I would suggest not getting it. Why? Because you've got two times as much drivetrain and it's crammed into the same small space Plus, you've got this issue of tires, yeah, right? And change all of them. Yeah. They're expensive. If, on an all-wheel drive car, if you get a tire that's damaged and can't be repaired, you're supposed to replace all four of them. And if you don't, it's going to beat up the drivetrain. So people don't understand that, right? They go to the lot and they say, ooh, Eddie Bauer, it's got leather seats. But they don't understand that lurking underneath that car is an all-wheel drive system. It's full time all wheel drive too, right? Mr. Oakliff, you most know what I'm saying? Most know of them are all time all wheel drive. Gabe, yeah, what's going on? You know what I've learned since I've been taking this class that a lot of people don't want to hear all that stuff. A lot of people don't want to hear about the reliability of cars. You know, everybody just wants to flash, flash, flash. Everybody wants like Not what's going to look tight, what's going to look nice, what's going to make, what's going to be status. But nobody you know, cares about it. Like, you what other people yeah. think I have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, the other people don't really care. Yeah. Yeah. You know? what, what does everybody else think is cool? Yeah, people are valuing the wrong things. Exactly. What did Chuck? What did Chuck say to me this weekend? He said, "If you're a free thinker, you're gonna be out there, you know, on your own. You are. So most people, it's just easier to, you know, think what everybody else thinks. That's why they go to, you know, TV news and stuff like that, because they, you know, they just want to think what everyone else thinks because it's safer. That way, you don't have to think about stuff." 
Now, Gabe, I'll tell you one thing I saw, you know, Texas went down hard on this electrical stuff. But what happened was the new Ford, Rudy, what's up with the new Ford trucks? You mean the hybrid one that's got the generator built in it? Yeah. Guess what? Any electric truck will do the same thing. What was happening was, you know, ele uh, you know, Texas lost power. And what was happening was the new Ford trucks have a generator on them. So what they were doing is they were powering their houses off their trucks. So they were running, you know, they were running this engine like 24 hours a day. But even then, they get so much better gas mileage than a freaking generator would. You could just fill up the truck once and run it for three days That's at idle, whatever. And and the best part was is that all it does is it turns the gas motor into a generator. Right. That's yeah. all it is doing. It's recharging the hybrid battery while you're pulling the current from the hybrid battery into um, – to power up heaters for your house so you're not freezing to death. Yeah, I mean... Cause look at the people who have solar and Tesla power walls. Their entire neighborhood was pitch black. Their entire house was lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were sitting there laughing about how they're in 70-degree weather temperature in their house while all their neighbors were freezing to death. I'd have been like, hey, why don't y'all all come over and just camp in my garage? Right. Uh, it should be, but. Is that what, what that would do? Yeah. That's yeah. what I'd do. I'd be like, hey, look, I got power. Yeah. I can keep you guys warm. Just all y'all come put up your tents in my garage. And there you go. You guys can stay in 65 degree temp when it's minus 27 outside. Yeah, people don't even know their neighbors anymore. That's kind of sad. Exactly. Luckily, I know mine already. <laughs> yeah, people, a lot of people don't. Oh, incidentally, did you know that you can buy bulk food from the LDS? Oh, yeah. LDS canning? Well, then why didn't you tell me this? I, just, I never asked about it. <laughs> now, here's Wait, I told you I was a Mormon, right? What? I'm a Mormon. I was really? raised Mormon. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, really? That's interesting. Wow, cool. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, so interesting. Well, I about that, that. But not about the food. <laughs> that what? Oh, about the food? Yeah. Did you know that all these solar panels went down when they got snow on them? Yeah. And the windmills all had to be shut down because all the grease inside, all the oil inside them turned to grease. So this, re this renewable energy thing has got real, real problems when it comes to weather. Now, what's what's coming down in the future superconductors what's a superconductor a superconductor is a piece of wire that has or whatever that has zero resistance at room temperature right now we got superconductors but it's only at like minus 60 degrees what do you think these people are doing in the Antarctic? they're not just there to look at penguins we have we have superconductors but we don't have room temperature superconductors once we get room temperature superconductors the efficiency of everything electrical goes so skyrocketing through the roof, we won't even measure uh, the price of electricity because it won't be worth it. So that will change completely the, well, not completely, but it'll change amazingly the landscape of uh, vehicles because you know we'll run everything on electric at that point. Motors won't get hot, right? Because without resistance, resistance is what causes the motors to get hot. Resistance is what causes the wires, everything to get hot. So we got to look to the future and say, well, you know, I mean, but we've been waiting on those for 30 or 40 years. What we want to do is we want to protect, what did Yogi Berra say? It's hard to predict things, especially about the future. Um, so what do we do? It's like, we're talking, you know, we were, we've been talking about financial stuff all night. Um, what we do is we have to protect ourselves and start looking, scanning the horizon and seeing what's going on, you know, and, you know, it what the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, right? I don't know where that came from, but I know it. So we have to keep our eyes open, keep awake, you know, don't get lulled into a false sense of security or complacency. That's tough. Got to keep your eyes open. Sometimes it's hard to keep your eyes open, especially when you see what, your eyes can see, but Sometimes it's not. 
Sometimes yeah. it's hard, sometimes it's not. <laughs> sometimes it's far too easy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 All right, what are we doing next? Mm. Oh, we got to do a safety test for the uh, for the shop. shop. Yeah. Because next week is the last class session before we go to shop. Yeah. Ah, okay, so we'll do safety test, yeah? Yeah. Did you learn anything? Yay. So we had success. I'd say we had success. Yeah. Good. And I'm glad somebody did this math because <laughs> it made me sad. Yeah. That's interesting. Boy, we're surrounded by interesting people. That's cool. Now, do something useful for me. Dance, monkeys, dance. It was a joke. Um, good. Yeah, we're surrounded by interesting people. And I can't wait to get in the shop and start throwing some wrenches around. Yeah. I can't wait either. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Oh, Me neither. Yep. Can I bring cupcakes? Yeah, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> don't expect don't expect a warm oh. welcome if you don't. Yeah. That's like, pretty. No, you can't. <laughs> oh no. Oh no, I hate those things. Right? I just want to make sure, you know. So you asking a fat guy, fat guy if he wants cupcake. You yeah. want me to make the same kind I made that day? <laughs> that day. Which day? The birthday cupcakes. My birthday. Okay. The yeah. better than they're called better than sex cupcakes. I. That's what they're called. That's the name of them. <laughs> yeah. Hey, right now. Certainly okay. far more available. Certainly far more easily uh, easily available. That was a joke. Anyways, <laughs> it is currently nine o'clock, folks. I sure appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Yeah, and it was a great class. You. Yeah, great class. Yeah, thanks so much. I will see you next, next week. Thursday, next huh? week. Can't yep. wait. Oh, happy a good week. Patrick's happy St. Patrick's Day. Bye, I everybody. Thank me, you. Right? Good night. Bye. 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 Appreciate it. Bye, y'all. Bye. Oh, shoot. Huh? Right there. And whoops. Let's go here. Good night, Joel. Good night, <laughs> Mr. Burke. Appreciate it.